Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, opening the March 6th uh, meeting of the uh, Montpelier Board of School Directors. Uh, have a busy night, as everyone, I'm sure. Yes. We do. It's on our agenda. Give them time, Tina. Give them time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just said hello. Man, start. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we have a busy agenda. Um, as you know, folks know, uh, we are going to have to revisit our budget. Uh, we are also going to have to reorganize. Um, I also want to congratulate, if that is the right word, um, Tim Duggan for joining the board uh, and uh, Mia Moore and Jake Feldman for re-election and Kristen Gettler. And Scott. Uh, oh, and Scott you. Lewin Those for re-election as well. And here's Kristen. And Kristen, who's just coming in, who also uh, was re-elected to board. Thank you for stepping up again uh, and serving. I also want to give a, a shout out to, to Tim Favorite, who who ran, um, and we really appreciate people stepping up to, to serve, and, and Tim Favorite might be the, the winner from last night. Um, but no, we are all quite, quite happy to be here, but we do have some tough work ahead of us. Um, we do, this being the meeting of a newly formed board, um, uh, we are going to reorganize. That is on our agenda after uh, public comment and um, and the consent agenda. Um, in terms of reorganization, I would be happy to serve as chair again. I've, I've talked to to me about it. Um, given that turnover is good, this will probably be both my last term. I have two more years of my term, and I will probably step down after chair after this year. Um, so uh, for kind of next year, for people who might wanna um, think about a leadership position, obviously Mia would be fantastic, but I don't think she's 100% there. So um, it's a year away, but but start thinking about it. But that's kind of where my, my thought is. It's been, but then it will be 10 years on the board and my seventh year as chair. And with the exception of superintendents, who should serve much longer than seven years in their role. <laughs> seven sure. years is a pretty good run in a leadership position. Um, um, and I think what we're going to do is just because of the, the budget and also because um, we have uh, at least one new member, I think I will just give a quick rundown of the committees and what they do and push off actual selection until we have a little more time because we're not going to be doing committee work in the next week and a half. Uh, and I think we have the luxury of of waiting to, to reform those. Uh, and that can take some time. I think we want to be thoughtful about it. And also, I think probably Tim does not have much of an idea right now of, of where he wants to, to serve. Um, and I do not want to speak for Jill, but I know she sent out a message that uh, after very heroically uh, serving as, as chair of the um, the tech center board, uh, she is looking for some relief from that role. Um, and am I correct in saying that you'd be happy to be replaced entirely? I would, or if failing that, I'd be happy to be the MRPS representative, but I've already let everyone on the career center board know that I will not be chair yeah. at least, so. So if anyone is interested in that, I don't think we, we have to point tonight or no. Um, <laughs> I think when did I see the 12th? I think we should. Yes, we can. Um, so we'll have to do that as well. Uh, we are going to have two public comments tonight. I'm, I'm adding a second. We're adding a second public comment to the agenda, uh, just because of the budget vote. We're going to have the initial public comment. Uh, then Libby is going to discuss some options for another um, for a, a second budget, which we have to do quickly. She's going to explain the timeline, which is fast. And John Odom, thank you for coming. The town or the city clerk uh, is going to help us make sure that we get all of that right. Um, 
Uh, and um, yeah, so we'll have a second public comment after that presentation. Um, yes, and then we will also, I think almost certainly have to have a special meeting. Uh, I doubt we will make a decision on a second budget tonight. We'll probably have a special meeting sometime in the next uh, seven to 10 days to uh, decide on a budget and put it forward. But I'm, I'm hoping that we can at least give Libby some pretty strong guidance about what that second budget should look like um, by the end of the evening. Uh, so with that, uh, why don't we do the first public comment? Again, you will have a second opportunity to have public comment uh, after uh, we have the budget discussion. So if there's anyone who wishes to go uh, up first in this public comment, uh, please do. Could we? Could I see a show of hands in the room? Because I just want to. One, two, three, and then could people online uh, do the raise hand function if you plan to speak? I'm just trying to get a sense of um, how many people. And I don't love to put time limits on, but if we've got a, a ton, uh, so it's only one. Um, so. Uh, not going to do any sort of clock thing, but if people could try to keep their comments reasonably short, a minute or two, that would be appreciated. Um, and so why don't we start with the room? Whoever wants to come up first, again, please introduce yourself for uh, the uh, audience, both in the room and uh, at home. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we're, we're obviously very interested in hearing your thoughts. So. Um, whoever wants to come up first, please do. <laughs> I'm Tina Muncie, and I live in Montpelier. And I know your superintendent will have a proposal for you to consider tonight and for the next budget to be voted on. And perhaps she will have cut a position, perhaps she will have cut a program or reorganized it. Perhaps she will advise um, to put off some facility improvement or something that needs to be made. Um, but I'd like to say I've been watching you and listening to you. And I think there's a percentage of the board that now thinks that it would be best fiscally and educationally to bring the students from Roxbury into Montpelier to be educated. And if that's really true, then I'm wondering why you would have the taxpayers spend 1.5 million or whatever it turns out to be to have for a year to have that decision just sort of put off for a year. So, I wish, I know you've uh, in the process of establishing a committee to talk about it, but that committee could meet with your superintendent for the next five months and decide the how and the best way to have the students come in. So I'd like to ask you to consider, when you're considering the next budget, consider that as one of the options you might take instead of putting it off do it next year. So I thank you for even considering it in your considerations. And as always, I thank you for the time you give our children and the careful thought. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I saw a couple other hands. Hi, uh, Tim Favorite uh, from Montpelier. Um, I just wanted to take this public opportunity to congratulate Tim and Jake and me and Scott and Kristen. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish you the best of luck and this is not gonna be an, uh, an easy road ahead, at least in the short term. Um, yeah, in terms of the budget, uh, I would, you know, it was clear, clear that it was defeated by a lot of anger and fear and a good chunk of misinformation. Um, and I would just urge you not to overreact to that. Uh, there, there are things you can do, like closing Roxbury Village School. That's been um, that's been mentioned many times. Uh, but that is 
an irreversible decision that has a really huge impact on a lot of people. Um, so I would urge you to find something, maybe you can put off facilities or, you know, I, I don't know, so, something that could be reversed for a year before we rush to a decision that that is just going to wreck a lot of folks. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the effort. Let me know. John? I'm not going to, uh, John Guifrey from Roxbury. Um, I won't go into all, I've advocated twice uh, online for making sure that we don't make any rash decisions on this. And uh, unfortunately, I'm here to try to set the record straight. Um, a lot of misinformation has been tossed out. I'd call them red herrings. None of it has necessarily been false, but providing false equivalencies uh, without the full knowledge of what went on there um, is wrong. And you guys need to know it because by my count, there's only four people in this room right now that were here for the merger committee work. Um, Jim's in a position where he can't say much on this. Tina has obviously advocated for this. Nancy in the back. Um, I will have to tell you, um, Tina has put out uh, these red herrings. Her posting today is what brought me in here. I didn't intend on being here. I was at soccer practice and I left to come here and make sure that at this critical time, you guys know the full story as to what happened during that merger committee because she was quoted three meetings ago, I believe, saying we never promised to keep kids there. That's not factually inaccurate, okay? We all read the merger documents, I'm sure. It was guaranteed there for four years. After that, just like any other school building, you can't guarantee anything indefinitely into the future. Who knows what's gonna happen with Main Street Middle School? We can't say in some merger document that we're always gonna have kids there. What was very clear during all of our conversations was that closing our school was off the table. And if any of the people in the room want to disagree with me, have at it. But that would be false because as a community of Roxbury, we need that building occupied. That is the heart of our community. And however she wants to portray it as, well, you never know, and we're just providing information. She's not providing the full picture. And the full picture is that school was supposed to have kids in it in some capacity indefinitely into the future. And that was the gist of it. We weren't interested in anything else. And I'll say this because no one else in this room can say it. Let's be honest with this. Both communities used each other to help each other out during that merger. I was a vocal proponent against Act 46. I spoke up in the Joint Education Committee against it. I thought it was a terrible idea. It didn't go far enough. It didn't do enough to save the money and create all the hassle. However, once it was passed, it was passed and we got down to work and we got something done. And it was one of the most successful mergers that has had some of the fewest hiccups. However, Montpelier benefited from Roxbury joining because they didn't have to join with anyone else. It's made them safe. So everyone in the Montpelier community, you need to understand that. That's likely one of the reasons that they chose to talk to us. And for Roxbury, it was great for us. We benefited from the, the partnership with, with Montpelier. The people in our town that support the school are most aligned with the city of Montpelier and the way they support their school. I think this is the first time in like a decade that either of our, our budgets ever didn't pass. Like we've traditionally been very supportive in both communities of our school budgets. And so, yes, we used each other to gain benefits. Montpelier was able to protect itself from having to merge with a bigger entity and Roxbury protected it for himself from being this orphan because our district fell apart. We were Northfield and Roxbury and it fell apart. We weren't allowed to stay that way. So I'm just here to remind people of the, the history here because the history is quickly vanishing into the past. And it's important that everyone who's making decisions knows the full history and not just one side of it. And I've kept my mouth shut until I saw that posting today because to pose this as, 
let's just come in and talk and save your taxes. It's a false equivalency. You guys are not going to be able to take $6 million out of your budget. It's just not going to happen. Something's going to change and it's either going to destroy this school district or the law will change. So starting to make cuts like this, that as this gentleman behind me pointed out are irreversible because we have one person presenting some sort of argument saying, well, you know, never really promised this and we can do that. What I'm asking you guys to do is just keep the big picture in mind and figure out a way where we can honor the commitment that these two communities brought together seven years, six years ago, whatever, I can't remember the actual number. Because that's important, honoring the commitments and knowing what those commitments were. There was no talk that, yeah, you know, whatever. If it doesn't work out, Roxbury, you can get on the bus. You guys are going to be in the very, very, and I've supported you guys and I continue to support you. I'm not, this has nothing to do with you. You have an unbelievably hard task to do here. Unbelievably. And it's not fair to you. And I will keep reminding you guys and everyone else in the city and both towns, this was brought on by the legislature and you guys are in the unenviable position of deciding whether you want to put a kindergartner on a bus for 35 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour, depending upon the route, because we want to try to quickly save a million and a half dollars if that's actually the number, because what do we do next year? Are you going to cut 2 million out of your budget next year? And then another 2 million, what's this building going to look like? What's the whole district going to look like? I don't know those answers. I'm here just to set the record straight and provide you that context. Cause I think it's really important because you have some amazingly hard decisions to do right now. And I don't envy you. And I do thank you again for all of the work that you do. Thanks. Peter. Hi, Peter Sterling from Montpelier. I have two kids in the school district. First, thank you all for and for serving on the school board. It's, I know it's a lot of time and it's a lot of work and it's it's important work. Um, you know, we have a great school. A lot of us live here in, in large part because we love our school and we want to see it continue to flourish and continue to be the great school that it is. I'd encourage you, um, you know, the budget went down and that's obviously very disappointing. I know you all worked really hard on it, but as you move forward to, re, to consider a new budget, remember, you know, we have a great staff, we have a great school, a lot of parents, a lot of people in this community like their school, even people without kids in the school see the value of it. So please, you know, do your best to mitigate those cuts. And just in reference to what the person preceding me said, I was on the school board when we did the merger. I wasn't on the committee, but I was on the board. And I don't ever remember promising that that school would never be closed. We had a lot of conversations about keeping it open. We had a lot of conversations that I recall about the eventuality if the school was to close, could it be reused in some way to benefit the district? But there was, I don't ever recall a conversation where we promised to keep that school open in perpetuity. That's just my recollection. So I just wanted to share that. And again, thank you for all the work you're gonna do to help this school be continue to be great. Yes. I hadn't raised my hand initially, but I appreciate your allowing me to speak. So I'm David Beatty. I'm a taxpayer in Montpelier. I've seen in the paper uh, listed uh, pressures. Thanks. So those are things that you should have been thinking about these past few years as budgets increased. And uh, a few years ago, I uh, tangentially, I remember there was a pressure to consolidate. And I think that's what the first person talked about. The second person talked about that you under a pressure to consolidate or be consolidated. So the law came up, you had to react to it. You chose Roxbury. So another law came up. Now that's really exacerbated the cost. Uh, whether that goes through or not, I don't know. But I think you've had some time now. I'd like to hear what have you thought about up till this time when the law changed again, where it became more of a financial picture, an impact that uh, that voters reacted negatively to. So the budget was voted against. Um, so as you go through these deliberations, I'd love to hear, you know, what things you've been doing right along with those mentioned costs in the paper, they were adding pressures. And I don't think that reassessment is actually a cost. Uh, it's a redistribution of your costs. 
Um, but I'd like to hear, you know, what you've done so far thinking about, well, what if, well, what if, um, over these years, thank you. Anyone else in the room? Yeah. Online, looks like we had at least one <coughs> raised hand. Two. Uh, two. Um, let's Catherine. start with Catherine. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. My name is Catherine Nunnally. I have been a Montpelier resident since 2015. I have two children currently attending MRPS and one who graduated in 2022. I also work at Montpelier High School as a student attendance specialist, and I'm co-chair of the AFSCME union, which represents support staff, tech staff, and custodial staff. More than half of our bargaining unit live in Montpelier, but all are part of the MRPS community. We wanna to continue to be part of that community, but these budgetary woes have some contemplating a change in employment. Please, when you are making these tough decisions ahead of you, keep in mind that there are people behind each of the FTEs you consider riffing. There are important relationships with students, caregivers, and staff at stake. Don't sacrifice the backbone of your schools before looking at all the other options. And I just want to take this opportunity that I wanted to a few weeks back to give a shout out in the name of solidarity to Allison Waring, a teacher who put in the effort and built an important relationship with my oldest son when he was in her science class at Montpelier High School. Thank you, Allison, for all that you do every day to connect with students and inspire them to be in this world and make it a better place. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, um, and Hannah Bryant. Hi there, my name is Hannah Bryant. I live in East Roxbury and I have one child at Main Street Middle School and another child at the Roxbury Village School. My background is in community planning, so that is my lens today. And I just really wanna to speak to the board, but also wanna to speak to those who are advocating to close the Roxbury Village School. Like others have, have said before me, this is an irreversible decision, but I think it's bigger than just what happens with that building. I encourage people to think about the dwindling student population and how that increases the cost per student um, and what it will look like if Roxbury Village School is closed and there's no opportunity for elementary school students to attend a local school and every student has to ride the bus. My student gets on the bus at 6.30 in the morning to get to Montpelier um, every morning. So for my eight-year-old to get on the bus at 6.30, a bus that is not at our house, so we leave home at about 6.10 a.m., um, that's a huge impact. And so I think it's pretty safe to say that families who have any other option will not choose to live in Roxbury, and that may really exacerbate our dwindling student population in perpetuity. So I totally understand that we're all freaking out about property tax increases, um, but I do think that this is a short-sighted move to close the school and that maybe we could explore amendments at the state level um, or other budgetary options. But I think that the long-term ramifications of closing Roxbury and making this a really undesirable community for any family to move to are going to have a lot more impacts on the Montpelier taxpayers in the long-term um, than this one tax increase that we're proposing in the next five years. So please consider other options. And for the Montpelier folks, you know, I really hope that you can consider Roxbury as a partner and not an adversary. It does feel like, you know, we're being seen as a ball and chain as opposed to an opportunity. There is a lot of developable land. There's a lot of housing in Roxbury. There's a lot of opportunity to bring new families to the community that would benefit all of us. So think about that opportunity and how we can all kind of uplift one another. Um, as we move forward. Thanks so much. Hey, Shanna. Uh, we have a couple more who, um, Dave Bellini, if I, sorry if I mispronounced that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Dave Bellini and I've lived in Montpelier most of my life and went to the school system and I'm trying to turn on my camera, but I don't know how to do it. 
You won't be able to, sir. Just you'll, we can hear oh, you. That. Yeah. Okay. Well, my background is in human services, 42 years with the state of Vermont. And I understand uh, good times and bad budgetary times, believe me. And I understand cuts and good days and good years. Uh, and it's never an easy thing. But I like to ask you all to put yourself in the place of maybe a senior citizen, uh, maybe some younger homeowners, uh, and what 20% increase means to them. Uh, they're the ones that are going to have to make really tough decisions. For some people, it's a choice of food or medication. For other people, it's I can't afford the increase because I can't pay my property taxes. For others, it's I'm not going to be able to keep my kids in the daycare I want. So uh, it's not just tough times for the school system. And I've supported the budget most of the years, but I had a vote against it this time because 20%, it's just not acceptable. It's difficult for me to remain in my home and some people have it worse than me. So it's not just difficult on the school system. It's difficult on the people that uh, live in Montpelier and probably Roxbury. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's not an easy time. So I just wanted you to consider that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, Parker Parker Ray. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, no, it sounds like it's James. <laughs> yes, hi. This is uh, James Ray on Parker's uh, computer. Parker's here with me. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak to remind the community, and I, I should start with, I don't pretend to know all the ins and outs about, <laughs> about what I'm about to say, but I think I know enough to say this, that to remind the community that the situation that we've been put in, um, I think, from my understanding, has more to do with directives and decisions made at the State House and the Governor's Office than it does to do with any actions taken right or wrongly by this school board. In other words, that the school board over the years has been put in positions to react to decisions passed down to them by the state house and the governor's office. And um, so I think as people task this, this school board to make their decisions, to please understand that they are reacting, not in a reactionary, they're, they're responding in a responsible way to decisions that they or none of us really have much control over. And speaking control over it, I guess the second part of my statement is a plea to any legislators out there who might be listening to this, who might read the transcripts of this, or to who any of you might be talking to, to please think through decisions a little thoroughly. Again, I don't pretend to know all of the ins and outs of this, but it very much feels like, especially in this last round, of, that the act that's led to this most recent budget crunch, that massive decisions were made before they really had a sense of how those decisions would play out in communities across this state. And my understanding also is massive decisions that were forced on school boards with ridiculously, and I think irresponsibly short timelines to react. Putting, putting communities like ours in situations where we have to make these tough decisions. And again, I think an un, irresponsibly short timeline, not irresponsible on our school board, irresponsible on the legislator and the governor's office that is putting these communities in these situations to make, like, it feels like pendulum swings are forced on us by the state level. And I just, my plea is to the governor and the state house to just slow down, put thought into these things before before these decisions are passed on to the communities and the school boards to respond. Because as I hope they can see right now, I think the report I heard was that 30% of the school board, school districts, 30 districts in this state did not say yes to their school budgets this year. And I think that's a reflection that they've all been put in situations that are untenable by the state house. So please, I think to our community, I, I would beg folks to remember who, you know, where this is all coming from. And I would beg the state house and the governor's office to please pay attention to this. Do what you can to rectify the situation now. And please, please, please take a more patient, thoughtful approach going forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you, James. 
uh, the Hannah, Hannah and Jane Pincus. Jane Pincus. And I th think if anyone else wants to speak, please raise your hand now, because I think otherwise I'd like to get to discussion and, and say further comment for the second comment period. Um, Hannah. Hi, my name is Hannah Zajac. I'm a Roxbury resident. And I have one kid in RVS and one in Main Street Middle School. Um, I'm actually the wife of a former board member that went through the merger process. Um, and it was an interesting time, but I can say wholeheartedly that it's been a very positive thing for us and our family. I've seen wonderful things happen at RVS. Um, and my kid loves Main Street. It's been a very positive experience. And I've been lucky enough to help coach with some of the... Um, track and cross country teams and meet some of the kids. And it's just been a super positive experience. Um, but my one thing I'd like to, I guess, point out is if we could continue with having a thoughtful discussion and forming the committee to talk about closing the Roxbury school rather than a knee jerk reaction, I think it would be a much better thing than um, trying to force something really quickly um, and leaving the kids at the center of the discussion. And if this is better for the kids, great. Um, you know, we'll talk about that and figure out what we need to do. But it, you know, we got to keep leave the kids at the center of the discussion as well. Um, that's it. Great. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. And then uh, Jane Pickus. Hi, I'm Jane Pincus. I've lived in Roxbury for over 50 years. It's a community that's changed over these years. It's growing. It's beginning to really thrive and thrust out roots and branches where people are starting to work together. It's so important also that, that our children in our school have the chance to be connected to people, to the kids in Roxbury. It's so important that the heart of our town stays alive and that I you know, heartily support what Hannah just said, that if we can look for creative ways and, and transparent ways to get our act together, to choose alternative ways of dealing with, with the expense of, of keeping locks very open, I think we should look for them and, and not just sit back and cut conversation off. I think that would leave really bad and, and negative feelings. And I think we could, I urge you, urge you to try and find ways to keep the two communities together, the two schools together. And, and with all my heart, I hope you can do that. And I encourage you to do that. And thank you. Great, thank you, Jane, I appreciate it. Um, Thank you, everyone. Again, we'll have a second public comment period after um, we have our budget discussion. Um, next item is the consent agenda, just for folks at home and for Dwell. And I'm going to take a wild guess that Tim knows what a consent agenda is, but in case you don't, um, uh, the consent agenda is essentially items <laughs> that uh, are pretty routine, like, uh, you know, approval of, of minutes, previous minutes, and our warrant for payroll, et cetera, uh, that don't require discussion. We put them together. Uh, the board reviews them quickly or deeply beforehand. And uh, if there's anything someone wants to discuss, we pull it off the consent agenda and separately discuss it. But it's, it's, uh, it's basically a way for us to get a lot of business done quickly without unnecessary discussion if we don't need it. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? A second. Uh, any discussion? I just I just quickly wanted yeah. to say, Libby, thank you for putting together those slides with the um, statewide data to make them easy for people to find and read. Um, do we have them on our district website yet? Yeah. There, it's really um, helpful to be able to have it at our fingertips so we don't have to go digging around on the AOE website ourselves. Yeah. So thanks for putting together that slide. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, um, Libby linked to it in her um, super, 
superintendent's report. Um, so you can find it there in the board documents and I hope we get it up on our website because um, it's information we should all have. So thanks for doing that. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay, great. Um, so now reorganization. Uh, this is where we choose our chair, vice chair, parliamentarian, uh, CVCC representative, uh, and I don't think we're going to do committee membership tonight. Um, I will just explain uh, largely for kind of Tim's edification, but also for folks at home who are, are watching and anyone who needs a reminder. Uh, <clears throat> we have um, it's like eight committees now uh, that uh, that we all serve on. Uh, most board members serve on two. I think there are a couple who who serve on on three. Uh, the committees do work that they bring to the board, but it's an, it's 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 a, a smaller group where we can delve into uh, specific aspects of uh, our work. Um, we have I will not talk about the future of Roxbury's Village School Committee. We can save that and wrap that up into a budget discussion. But we did form a committee to look at that. Uh, but our standing committees are uh, policy. Uh, we are a board that um, that follows policy. Those policies need updating, and sometimes we need to change or add new policies. Uh, that committee deals with those issues first, uh, does drafts, brings it up to the board for approval. Um, it's it's a great place for lawyers to serve because um, some of it's some of it's technical. Uh, uh, our negotiations committee is, uh, as it would indicate, it's it's the committee that does uh, negotiation with our three unions and uh, then brings uh, things to the board for approval from those those unions. The negotiations committee can be very quiet and it can be very intense depending on where we are in negotiations with with our various unions. Uh, the finance committee uh, basically uh, meets, I think, four times a year uh, to get a deep dive into our finances, uh, just because a lot of the, the finance and, and minutia of our budgets are pretty technical. Uh, we tend not to have a lot of board time for it. So what we've done is we've established a committee uh, that meets with our business manager and the superintendent quarterly when the reports come out. Uh, to do a deeper dive uh, and essentially that committee, if they find things that they feel needs the board's full attention, we'll bring that to the full attention. It's a way of having the board have knowledge of that without taking up the time to educate all of us. And, and some of us um, are more, more of an accountant mindset than others. So, um, so we tend to try to put people who have those strengths on that committee. Uh, facilities and energy, uh, is where we do a lot of the work in terms of, of our maintenance on buildings. Uh, it's where our, our climate work has taken place. Uh, they oftentimes meet with our facilities director, Andrew LaRosa, uh, and again, you know, help help bring uh, issues around you know, building improvements, building maintenance, um, our, our uh, net zero policy. Um, the Superintendent Evaluation Committee uh, works on one of our main tasks, uh, which is uh, really kind of our three main tasks are approving the budget, overviewing the superintendent, and then being community liaisons. Um, the Superintendent Evaluation Committee makes sure that we have a process for a meaningful and thorough evaluation of our superintendent uh, to make sure that that she is uh, both doing the job she'd be doing and also getting the resources and, and support from the board that she needs. Uh, our equity committee um, advances our DEI policy and makes sure that all of the, the work that we're doing uh, is properly considering uh, equity. Um, uh, Equity and, and that um, you know the, it also works with a lot of students because equity is a, obviously a huge issue for a lot of our students um, and um, you know some of those you know some of that work the work goes everywhere uh, and then we have our net zero ad hoc committee um, which is not a standing committee but has been assigned to 
really delve into our net zero policies and try to put some some meat on that as we move forward. Uh, so those are the eight committees, six standing. Yeah. I just wanted to add on the equity committee yes. that we have met a few times recently and um, there has been talk a little bit <clears throat> at the board level of committing or creating another committee yes. <laughs> for communication. Yes. And we have, um, as a as a current committee, now this could change if other people came onto the committee or whatever, but as a current committee, we've said mm -hmm. we would be willing to take on the work of establishing communication protocols and you know, sort of our general philosophy so that we wouldn't have to create a whole nother committee <laughs> to do that because it feels very in line um, with being an equitable board and being an equitable district is opening up access and yeah. transparency to the board. So I just wanted to put that out there as if anybody was interested, that would also be work that the equity committee would be doing this year. Yeah, excellent. No, that is a great um Great addition, and uh, we have had talk about communications committee because, as uh, folks on the board know, and and uh, uh, Tim for uh, kind of your education in putting together our our kind of district goals, communication and improving communication is is one of the the high ones. Um, so, uh, with that, um, let's let's choose our. Uh, our officers, and I think we can put off committees until um, either uh, probably till our next official meeting, because I think we'll probably deal with our budget at a special meeting. Um, again, I would be happy to serve as, as chair for another year. Um, so I, I would definitely entertain being nominated again. If someone else wants to step up and do it, I'm, I'm not going to wrestle you for it. Uh, but I, I would, it's been an honor to serve, and I, I certainly would be happy to continue to do in that role. So uh, I will entertain a nomination for chair. So it's a nomination, not a motion? It's, it's, it's a motion. I, okay. I think you nominate. nominate. I move that we nominate Jim Murphy as our chairperson. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the the, the trust and um, the yeah you know, the honor to serve for another other year. Uh, uh, vice chair uh, Mia Moore has been a fantastic vice chair. Uh, I'm sure she will continue to be one if she so so desires. But um, I will open it up for nominations and. Um, I, I think Mia would be a, a great suggestion. <laughs> is Mia, does Mia think Mia is a great Mia, teacher? Okay. I'm not, I've not seen her run or <laughs> shake her head. <laughs> uh, do I have a, a nomination for vice chair? I will move to nominate Mia Moore to continue to be vice chair for our board. Thank you. Second. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. You didn't even ask for discussion. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I don't need it. It's fine. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Since Anna does most of the minute taking, <laughs> the secretary is a pretty light lift, light enough that I forgot who the current secretary is. I, I think it might be Rhett. Rhett. Um, would you would you be interested in serving again? Maybe. <laughs> don't don't uh, see if anyone else is. <laughs> don't don't contain your enthusiasm. <laughs> Does anyone did, would anyone else be interested in serving as secretary? And what does that role entail? I think Say officially yes it's like no. the note taker, but okay. But so yes, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Anna. <laughs> yes, thank you, Anna. <laughs> Kristen? Yes. <laughs> Just slide it left. Yeah, slide it left. Sure. Yeah. It okay. sounds pretty uh low, low pro. Okay. Yeah. Um, I believe the only time Rep was put into action was when Anna had gave birth to twins. So she's not planning on doing that anytime soon. <laughs> she's promised me. I'd like a guarantee. <laughs> I'd like a guarantee. <laughs> and I think sometimes when we're in executive session, the clerk has to make sure we capture that. Who made the motions? Oh yes. Yeah. Sounds like I can. I'm capable of that too. Yeah. 
Um, I move to nominate Kristen Gettler as clerk, uh, sec secretary of the board. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second that. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right, congratulations, Kristen. Thanks for your faith for me to take on yeah. the responsibility. <laughs> uh, and then I believe that Jill is our parliamentarian. Um, Obviously, she just knew what the secretary does. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and I was going to I I got I don't know if you got it but VSBA sent like a a one page oh, laminated, yeah, laminated Robert's rules yes that. cheat sheet I, yes I remember to bring it um, uh, since you've had some time to familiarize yourself with that do you <laughs> want to continue on I'm happy to continue to be a mediocre parliamentarian for you all unless someone else is interested. Um, do I have a, a motion to nominate a parliamentarian? I'll make a motion that Jill continues to be a mediocre parliamentarian. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> I hope that's reflected in the minutes. It's better than uh, do I, second. 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 Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and then finally, the CVCC representative, <laughs> representative, as I spoke on Jill's behalf, but she nodded. Uh, Jill is currently doing that. She is willing to continue, um, but I get the strong sentiment that uh, she would not be crushed if someone. Can I give like the Twitter version of what it entails? Yeah. Yes. Please. Okay. So um, a few years ago, the Center Vermont Career Center became an independent technical center district. It was, it's it's still physically attached to um, Spalding High School in Barrie, and it serves the 18 towns of central Vermont. So um, I was the Montpelier Roxbury representative on the governance committee that um, worked with a consultant to actually literally sort of how do you become your own independent career center district. Um, and so then after that, um, voters agreed to do that. And so I was the Montpelier Roxbury representative. So the board for the Center Vermont Career Center is made up of board members from each of those six sending supervisory unions and then six um, appointed members of the public. So there's a member of the public that's appointed and there's a board representative from each board. So it's very equitable as far as MRPS, Twinfield, Cabot, Barry, Harwood, the whole gang. Um, Washington Central. So um, they meet once a month. And then similar to this board, there are subcommittees. Um, and what I ended up, you know, it was our first year ever and nobody was uh, ready to do chair. And I said I would do it for one year only when nobody else wanted to take that on. Um, and I stayed on for another year as chair. Um, that is a lot more work than being a representative on the board. And of course, with all the subcommittees, there's other work involved. So realistically, I probably took it a little too far, but it is a time commitment. Um, but it's also a really exciting time to actually be on the Career Center. They are, not only have they formed an independent district, but they're actively working on building a brand new Career Center somewhere else in Central Vermont. Um, so they really need someone who has the time and attention to like participate in that. And I just feel like as much as I would love to, and my heart is really with them, I don't literally have that time. Um, so I wanted to just genuinely open that up if anybody was interested in being on the Central Vermont Career Center Board as the MRPS representative. Can just add a couple of things to that? Where it is an exciting time for them, for that the, the tech district, and it is such an incredible resource for mm -hmm. um, this Air, for this area and obviously the tech centers that are serve other areas in the state are also incredible resources as a learning opportunity for kids who's who for whom like quote unquote regular school just isn't the right fit and and also kids who are thinking a little bit further ahead about what their career path is going to be even while they're sophomores and juniors in high school it's just an, an awesome awesome resource that we have and it would be a cool way to support um, to support that resource would be being part of that um, that board. And as we said last year, as Jim mentioned, most board members serve on, we serve on at least two committees. We um, said it makes sense that that role counts as a committee. <laughs> it, you, it wouldn't have to be the case that you would serve on two of the committees of this board and also be that if you wanted to be the representative from our board to that board because of that time commitment. Yeah, thank you.
And it is, it's really exciting. It's a really fantastic place. About half the students actually don't get in. It's a competitive process to apply. Um, and there's way more demand from students than there is literally space in that building. Um, and it means that we're having to turn away basically all kinds of fantastic free resources from the community and from the industries because they want to support it. And frankly, a lot of these students graduate from there with very well-paying jobs waiting for them. Um, so it's really cool to like go to the open house and it's just absolutely pulsing with students who have found their thing. Um, so you can probably tell, I really do care about it a lot and it's been great to be on it. And that's why, because I do care. I wanted to see if there were other people who had a little more capacity. The perfect storm was when I was negotiations for both, both boards. Um, really hard. um anyone interested? Uh, I heard from a little bird that there might be a tad bit of interest online. So um, if you all can hear me, hopefully you can't hear me. Um, yeah, I, I was on the RTCC board, um, I'm sorry, two minutes there, um, back in Randolph and would consider it can't be the chair for sure. Um, and I don't have, it's uh, really quickly, are they, are they all um, in person in Barry or are they on Zoom as well? No, we have hybrid just like this meeting. And honestly, because of the disparate places folks travel, the majority of board members like Cabot, Harwood, they're they're always participating remotely. I usually go in person because I live in Montpelier and it's not that far. Um, but yeah, it's hybrid similar to this. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jill would yeah. give it to you willingly, Scott. He would totally that. be cheating. We can't even see what he's doing. Yeah, Jill. I um I I can take this one. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. And I will be a huge supporter and helper however I can. Okay. Um, I move that we nominate Scott Lewins to be the Montpelier Roxbury um, School District representative on the Center Vermont Career Center board. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank well, you, Scott. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Scott. Thank and, you, Scott. And, and thank you, Jill. And thank you, Jill. I know oh, no, you've poured a cry. ton of work over the last <laughs> few years. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, no, thank you both. And thanks, thanks everyone um, for uh, being willing to uh, to serve. And we will um, we will get to committees later. And if anyone has question about committees. Uh, you know, feel free to email uh, me over the next couple of weeks. Um, and now, you're all sticking around. You weren't here for the really quickly, I do have one comment. I want. Oh, can you guys hear? Yes. Yes. Sort of. So, yeah, I completely agree that that um, the community assignment is not the highest priority. Although I am curious to hear. I I, I think there's enough. There's certainly an argument for at least setting up the future of Roxbury School Committee as soon as possible. It's a big conversation and a big decision, and one that I think is happening informally. Um, and it would be nice to get that um, formed sooner rather than later. And so, yeah, I I understand that the need to uh, focus on the budget, but but that's also something that I think is is you know equally important and right. So yeah, just wondering what others think about that that one particular and getting that uh, some sort of our system. Yeah, I I agree, Scott. I mean, my thought is, I think Roxbury is going to be a part of our budget conversation and how that committee looks and what its eventual charge might be may be informed by how our budget conversation goes. Um, that's that's kind of my thought, which is one of the reasons I, I held it. I'm okay circling back to it later tonight, perhaps after we've seen some of the options that um, Libby has and has had a bit of a conversation, but we do have a, a charge and we have a committee composition yes. and we have a deadline. So um, not that those things can't change, of course, but um, we have 
initiated the committee. And I, I definitely hear what Scott is saying is that it's got a big job to do as, as we've charged it so far. And um, I wouldn't want to delay getting the work of that committee off the ground unnecessarily. Um, and if we waited until say the March 20th meeting, then that's a whole nother two weeks that we aren't getting say letters of interest from the community yeah. for people who want to participate at that level. Yeah, I think that's all fair. I think we can circle back to it later tonight. Um, so now we're going to jump into the budget discussion. Uh, just a few comments. Uh, you know, we have had a lot of budget success. This is new territory for us. Um, I mean, I I think that we put out a reasonable and responsible budget. Uh, I think we put a lot of work into it and and did a very good job. And I think we we made some some tough cuts. Um, I understand why the community reacted the way it did. Uh, the, the tax implications are, are high. Um, I know that, that people feel that, uh, and I, I believe some, some people, you know, have made comments to that both in writing and otherwise, uh, and I know that other prices are high too, you know, groceries are high. People are having... Uh, to make tough decisions. Uh, I also know that we have, you know, income sensitized property taxes, but even with that, the, it raises for everyone. Uh, and even the people who can fully pay that um, are oftentimes the people who have the biggest commitments. They've got, you know, they're oftentimes paying the full amount because they're in their peak working years. But when you're peak working years, you've got college to save for, you've got, a million kid activities that suck up money. You've got, you know, you, you just, your expenses are often at, at the highest that they're at. So I understand why people feel very squeezed by that budget. And I also realize that a lot of the forces that led to what's a drastic change. I mean, we've never had numbers like this. Um, are out of our control and are this they really the, yeah, the result of some state policy changes and some other changes in terms of uh, you know federal money going away that that had kind of floated us for a few years, um, declining enrollment, uh, et cetera. Uh, that said, there was a message I think sent to us that um, we have more work to do and that. Uh, we need to go back to the voters with a, a budget that at least does something for costs. Um, I know that that my goal is to do that in a way that protects as much of our educational programming and what's best for kids as possible. Because if we do not have strong, good schools uh, with that are adequately funded, uh, that provide programming and opportunities for kids that kids need, uh, it's corrosive to our communities. Uh, if we are going to bring, keep and bring families here, uh, one of the first things they look at are the schools and what opportunities their kids have. Um, so we cannot, uh, we cannot corrode our schools uh, in the choices that we make. Uh, yet, um, I think we do have to be cognizant of, of the cost. So we've got a very difficult task ahead um, and I'm going to turn over to Libby, who's going to walk us through, I think, some of the administration stuff, and then we'll open up the board. But I, I just want to acknowledge both the the need to really strongly support our schools, uh, but also I think the the very legitimate um, angst and anxiety about what this is going to do to people's budgets and and the hard choices that people are going to make, have to make at home, um, you know, with with tax increases like this. So this job doesn't get any easier ever <laughs> that we got through the unprecedented times, but we're still well within the unprecedented time um, right now. So I am just providing the board with some potential scenarios. There is nothing written in stone whatsoever. This is ultimately um, how much of a tax increase we want to go back out to the voters is ultimately a board's decision, not an administrative team's decision. Um, so that is, that's primarily the decision you have to make and you don't necessarily have to make that tonight either. So this is information gathering. 
it's giving an idea to the board and the community of just how much we'd have to cut and what those potential cuts could look like if um, to get to certain tax rates. That's, that's the purpose of this right now. Um, it is incredibly hard to talk through this. We had an administrative meeting this afternoon and I look back and Jason, who's here for some moral support, I know my high school principal, um, and it was a tough meeting. So I know that. All right, so we have a timeline for a revote, and John Odom has kindly come tonight after I've talked to him a few times on the phone um, over the last couple of weeks and today. Um, by, so there are two things that the board needs to work with, the statute as well as our contracts. Um, so what's in statute after a revote or for a revote is that a public notice has to be provided. Um, the public notice is the warning, just as you warn school board meetings and that kind of thing. Um, and a vote can be had seven days after the public notice has been provided to the community. A public informational meeting must occur at least five days following the public notice. Um, and if it's re re rejected again, this process can start over. Now, John has, has put it so professional and nice to me. And he said, yeah, that statute doesn't really work out with reality. Um, and so I, uh, we have to, we're working with our partners over in the town clerk's office, as well as our administrative team and our community and the school board. So there's lots of people in that, um, conversation. Um, and John clarified with me today around like, what does, what does that kind of turnaround look like? And there's pressures on both his office as well as our MRPS contracts. So I'll, I'll do the contracts first and then I'll give John the opportunity to. I don't want to put you on the spot, John, but give John the opportunity to speak though about the pressures from the clerk side of things. Um, in our AFSME contract, um, just as Catherine spoke of earlier, our AFSMEs are our custodians, our, our tech people, our um, administrative assistants. There's a, the, there is a notification of reduction in force by March 15th for AFSME. Um, there is nothing in there for a second vote or a failed vote or anything, it's just the vote. Um, in the MREA contract, as I spoke about before, the notice of a RIF or a reduction of force must be given at, at by March 31st for a failed first vote. Um, so that's the kind of timeline John and I were talking about today. And then I also wanted to point out that all administrative contracts um, have to be renewed by contract by February 15th. So our admin team have already gotten their contracts as is written in their legally binding contract and statute the principal position, if they've been in their position for two years, need to have their contract renewed by February 1st. That's part of statute. So um, those administrative contracts have been given out and have been signed by the administrative team at this point. That's state law. The 15th? The first. The first for principals, for the principal position. And that, that's a state law? Yeah. Huh. Um, what is it, can you, Explain what who the administrative group is. Yeah, so anybody with an administrative license, so including myself. So myself, the principals, the assistant principals, director of curriculum, director of special education or student services, as we call it here, um, director of social emotional learning, uh, director of flexible pathways, and as well as people who do not have that administrator certificate, like our business manager, director of facilities, um, Anna. My, my executive assistant, Heather, the director of human or coordinator of human resources, that's part of their contract as well because their contract kind of mirrors an administrator's contract. So those, what I'm hearing you say is those contracts have all been signed. Yes. There's no RIF we could make at those levels because those contracts have been signed. There would be legal yeah. ramifications yeah. potentially yeah. from that. I just wanted to put a fine point on that. Yeah. That's <laughs> very helpful. Yeah. But central office staff would fall in one of the would fall in the MREA group? No, no. they're the administrative no. ones. Like the- Give me an example of a central like office staff. staff. You know, like we learned early on, central office staff went from 15 to 26, additional 11 people who had been ESSER funds, but are now normal payroll and their, their administrative contracts. No, we didn't hire- I any. don't think those are no. all central office staff. Those are central office staff. Okay, so they're under one of the different, yeah, the, their yeah. MREA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so as John pointed out to me earlier, the law for a revote is not exactly friendly to a town's clerk's office. John, do you want to step up to this mic here so everybody can hear you at home? And could I ask you a question quickly? Yep. So when those reduction in force notices, it, they're, they're specific notices that go out to specific people by those timelines. It's not a general statement that there will be a reduction in five positions. Is that correct? Uh, the information that I provide to Joe, our union leader, is uh, that it's the position with the licensure category. Okay, so three teachers and two assistants or whatever. Uh, it would be the licensure category. So it would be, a you know, since we already have decided on a K-6 RIF because of enrollment, it would be um, reducing in force one, one K-6 K license. It's not person specific at no. that point. No. Okay. No, because then it goes to seniority. Okay, John, you're on for the realities of the town clerk's office. Well, first of all, I will assume that the clerk's office role in this would be myself and my deputy just basically putting on the election. Um, since you've got your own infrastructure for doing all the warnings and everything like that. So I wouldn't have to think about that, which is great because I hate thinking yeah. about this thing. Um, yeah, and Libby brought it up and she mentioned the date and the outside date being the 28th for an election, and I hope we keep it as outside as we can. I don't think I, I don't think I said anything. <laughs> I think I was sort of stupefied by it. Um, the quick answer, if you ask me if we could pull off an election, and, and if somebody made me give you a quick answer, I would say no. Um, now, if you were to look at me like I was Scotty and you were Captain Kirk and you told me, well, how are you going to do it anyway? Just kind of what I did. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> um, I would say it would have to look a couple ways because one of the, 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 the problem, there's a few challenges in there. The biggest one is legally everybody who got an absentee ballot for this last election needs to be sent one for this one. So we got a, a robust early vote. It was about 800 people. So that means 800 early ballots would have to go out. So there'd have to be time for people to receive them. There's no, it's not set in statute. I mean, theoretically, you're not breaking the law if they don't receive their ballot until the day before the election. But that's going to create problems for you in a lot of ways. And, you know, possibly could set you up for legal action. I don't even know. It's uncharted territory. So given the realities of how we do elections here, uh, we... You know, I've always used the auditorium in City Hall. We have, for a very long time, always used tabulators and had those programmed and have ballots professionally printed and have tabulator run elections. If we did something by the 28th, there's none of that would could be true. Uh, Lost Nation Theater has the auditorium tied up. So we'd have to find another location. And the obvious location would be here which is going to maybe make some people feel a little ooky about another revote on the school budget at the school, but it would have to be, there really wouldn't be a way around it. I could talk to a local church, but I think another public building is, is probably the way to go. It also could not be a tabulator election. There's just not time. They would need two weeks to turn that around. Um, and that wouldn't even necessarily include the printing time. So we'd be talking a hand count election, something I've never done before. But um, it's the first time for everything. Um, so that's that's what you're looking at if you want that kind of time frame. This things aren't usually turned around this quickly. For example, Barry is doing their uh, vote on their second bite at the apple in mid May, and presumably under this under the same type of pressure as you all. But that's far more typical is to push that out quite a ways. If you did push it out farther, we could have the auditorium unfortunately no earlier than the last tuesday in april so that's pretty far out too but if you really want to try to keep it under that 28th time frame then that's what it would have to look like really is a hand count here what i'd want to say to the board is we don't have to do that the ramification of of not knowing a past budget by may is twofold one our entire mrea staff would get RIF notices if we miss that March 31st deadline, because you, you'd you need, it's gonna sound awful, but you'd need the freedom with a budget, right? Yeah. Um, 
So they would receive RIF dividends only or RIF notice only because of that language in the contract, not for any other reason. Um, and then the, the second potential ramification is that if the budget goes down for a second time um, and we need the same lead, lead time to get a third vote up and running, um, that would push you into FY25. And when we move into FY25, that's when the we can only work off of 87% of our FY24 budget is available to us. So there's financial ramifications for that pushback. Okay. I have a couple questions. Um, can we mail everyone a ballot? Um, Whether I, they requested one or not, is that what you're saying? A registered voters. All registered voters? Um, I don't see why not. That would be your all's choice as to how to run your, how, how you wanted to proceed with that. And I'd just be, again, I'm making some inferences here, but I'd just be the person putting it into, putting into effect. Because I think there's money for that in H850, that bill that passed. Only if you, only only if you pushed push back, back. No, if you delayed your budget. Oh, you delayed your budget. On the budget. The decision we made not to do on February seventh. So that would be a dramatic on. change in the scale of the election too, and I would push back a little harder on the idea of, of spreading it out, stretching it out a little, so we could use those tabulators. Uh, Was it earliest we can get a tabulator? Um, well, I was trying to talk to see if to folks today to see if there was some way we could have it by the 28th. They could program it for me and have it all turned around by in two weeks, they said. Uh, after that, I could probably have the printed, and that would be, tabulators would be ready to go. Um, then I'd have to have the ballots printed probably about another week. So we're talking about three weeks, and then we have to mail them to the 800 people. Mm -hmm. So that stretches that out a little farther. So we're probably talking about mid-April? Yeah. So if we did it in mid-April and sent RIF notices, we could do that, and then we would at least reduce our risk of heading into FY25. Yeah, yeah. what? I'm sorry. Yeah, because you Lincoln, could have a you could have a separate no, vote. I didn't that. hear the end of your sentence. I having... said if we if we say say we gave an extra two weeks, yes. two or three weeks, went into mid-April, sent the RIF notices, which I know. Hopefully we can explain it well so we reduce heartburn because I'm sure that's not yeah, gotcha. pleasant. <laughs> um, then we could have a little more time to make John's life easier and <laughs> and have a tabulated election and make sure that you know ballots get out and word gets out and reduce the risk that if it fails a second time. That we have, I mean, 80, 87 percent of our existing budget is bad uh, and not a place we want to go. We would, we would be able, we'd use our fund balance to help. Yeah, yeah. We would have to. It would, it would yeah. still not be great. Right. And and it would and it would eat our fund balance. Yes. Yes. But it's just eighty-seven percent until you have an approved budget. Until you have an approved yeah. right yeah. of the current budget, not of the planned budget. Right. It, yeah. You're and you're right. It would only be until we get. <laughs> I mean, like, given the the increases that are due, our current budget would mean a lot of people couldn't go to work for a while. It depends on when paychecks start, because not everybody's on a on a twenty six paycheck cycle. Uh -huh. um, so it depends. Yeah. But it also would depend on what we decided not to pay. I mean, right. it doesn't yes. have to be salaries that we choose not to pay. It could be maintenance or for a couple months, deferred maintenance yeah. and things. Yeah. 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 No, exactly. Okay. But it would. It is tricky. It 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 in, puts in a whether we're talking about the RIF notices or not, or the uh, second failed budget, which I really hope doesn't happen. Um, it it in, introduces a lot of instability into our highly functionable system and puts a lot of stress on my amazing educators world. I mean, it means operating on $8 million less than the budget that's left out for some period of time. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Is there anything you else, else you wanted to share with us? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I think you've got the picture of it there. And obviously, after you all have made a decision, we'll talk right away yeah. and put whatever it takes into motion. Yep. Absolutely yep. the first moment possible. Is Roxbury facing the same challenges for setting up relo there if you talk to the clerk? I haven't I haven't talked to Tammy in any kind of depth. Um so I, I but the process she, would be the same for Roxbury. So I mean it's know. it's gonna be similar. Um she's she is not as isn't sweating it as much as I am. She basically said, You're the bigger town, you're gonna have a harder time with it, so I'll back right. you up. Um, so I, she's not as um, wild-eyed and frantic about it as I am. So. Okay, so we're assuming that they can be pulled up here and be pulled up there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Scott and then Jill. We have a quick question for John. Um, you mentioned a hand count, and I'm, I, I can assume what the downsides um, and upsides are, but I'd love for you to just share what you perceive as downsides and upsides to a hand count over calculators? Okay. Well, I think the biggest downside, I think it's about context. I think it's about where we are. It's just not something that people are used to. And it's not the way we think of running elections in Montpelier. And I think, um, I, I just think anything that looks different and feels different might uh, create some potential friction is all. I think there'll probably be potential friction from having in a different place since all of our elections for centuries have been in, in the same place. Um, I, I think that's that's the big difference, really. I mean, I'm going to say something you're not supposed to say and that tabular tabulator counts are more accurate time and time again. It's been shown. So there's that. But we're talking very tiny, negligible degrees here. Um, I mean, the, the biggest concern for me personally is that I've never done one before, although it does not sound like it completely unfun. <laughs> <laughs> like a <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, you know, we pull off whatever you need. And it would be like a one question ballot. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the way I would do it, if it was a hand count, it'd be a lot cheaper because I'm going to have to charge you all for this too. Um, is just to have printed out pieces of paper, cut them in half, you know, take them to a nice printer, nice little color thing with the one question on it, send them to a mail center, mail them all out to the 800 people, have a big, big ballot box container there, and we dump it out on the table, divide it into stacks of 50, get about 16, 20 people, divide into twos, and just go through it and tally them up. And an hour and a half, two hours later, we have it. The, the result so cute you know fun but different Sounds very homey. it's very homey it's but but i would not over i would not underestimate i think the impact i ran this by a few people and they were all like they they thought it was a bad idea because they thought people would react badly to it because it's different in some sense that maybe the school was trying to get some kind of special treatment or the way things were being counted or having it done at the school was somehow not, you know, above board or something. What's that? But that's the, I mean, that's the only real difference is, is um, what are people going to expect other than just the, again, the level of how frantic will I be to get it going? I'm, I'm always in favor of less frantic. Uh, oh yeah all i was going to ask is it sounds like maybe realistically mid-april or may and that we make sure it doesn't happen during april break a lot of people might not be here you could have the on april 29th we could have the auditorium that'd be the only time but i realize that pushes it out kind of late that is during school i thought it was the week after the break no, no. oh Whoops. No, the 29th and would that's, be back. The 29th is the earliest you could have the auditorium. Well, it's that Tuesday. It's the 29th the or the 30th? The 30th is the Tuesday. The 30th is the Tuesday. I mean, okay. That's the, We'd that's be the back. Tuesday after break. Okay. We'd be back. I, I mean, thought the break was the week before. We go on the city budget at City Hall. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> you know. School budget out of school? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's, it's yeah. yeah. It's common across Vermont, too. Yeah. 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 I mean, I get public works to throw all my crap yeah. in a truck. Yeah, and we don't have like a completely yeah, neutral location. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what you're saying. I just yeah. wanted to get, I'm just trying to wrap my head around everything you've told us. And <laughs> I, I think what I hear you saying, and so I definitely want you to correct me if I'm hearing incorrectly. I'll try. I'm really <laughs> tired. <laughs> I believe it. I really appreciate you being here. Um, is that it? we could hold an, an election or the vote on March 28th, but what that would require is hand counting and printed ballots and having it here at the school. That's right. And you would be, the, the, the tension you, would, you might feel, the pushback, the other pushback you might get would be the lack of time to turn around those ballots that were mailed out right. to those 800 people. Okay. So, okay. that's, so that's, that's, the other one. that's what we're looking at if we wanted to try and adhere to the contract that the um, that is in our current the, the agreement language. that we've yeah made yeah okay. contract language thank you okay I just wanted to make sure I understood that and that these other dates we've been talking about give you the time for tabulators and, and a little more breathing room a little for people more breathing to mail room it back mailing yeah okay thank you does the second vote need a specific uh, date or can it be like vote by the state so you know people could get ballots in the mail and then return them to city hall by a certain date well i mean the the by date would be the whatever the date the election was was picked i mean yeah if i'm not sure i understand the question well, if you do an absentee ballot, you can put it in the drop-off box early, like if you're going to be away or something. Is that what oh, right. We'd open up the drop box for sure. Do that. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah. Fully mail and drop election. Oh, you're, you're still, still thinking talking about that there's no in-person voting. Minimal in-person <laughs> voting. <laughs> well, I mean, the biggest, um, it's more of a logistical challenge, and it's certainly more of a financial commitment. Um, but if you all wanted to talk about it, I mean, we could do that. Is it like a dollar each for 8,000? Oh, votes? yeah, I'm not prepared to, uh, if I, if I'd gotten through to the mailing center today, I might have been able to tell you, but I wasn't able to reach anybody today. Um, they unfortunately. Have towns calling them. Do you have any idea what the, um, percentages, the difference between in-person voting and mail, if, if it was a mail-in, like, do you have any sense of the return on those? You know, <laughs> it's interesting because I did some studies on this one time. Um, if you're talking, uh, uh, if you mail them all out to folks, the, the, the deviation between high turnout and low turnout elections levels out near that higher end. It doesn't really increase the turnout of high turnout elections, but it brings a lot of the lower turnout elections up more towards that level. So, um, you know, it's hard to guess what the turnout of this would be. We had a pretty strong turnout um, yesterday, but obviously a second vote is going to be a fraction of that. And, you know, what fraction, who knows, but probably uh, if you did it, if you sent out, all mail in, you would bump it right back up to that level. I would guess maybe even a little higher. That'd be a lot tougher call for a, a hand count one though. Definitely, that would be a tabulator election and it would take, uh, yeah, no, we could, we could do it. Be a big job for a big mail house though. <laughs> <laughs> Said that the police station would be available for voting as well. Okay, that's that might deter some people. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, forgive me, were you clerk the last time we needed to go to a second vote on the budget? Oh, this is all new for me. Okay, great. So we're in the same as, as anybody. I don't remember, I don't remember it, and I don't remember what the timeline was that they went with when they had the second I just looked it up, I think it was April 15th. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. Yes, Carol Dawes welcomed me to this world today when I was speaking to her. Should I another question? Would it be possible to print ballots in just say yes or no without the text and then get that in the works and 
print the sheet and get in to the mailers and get the enclosure and it will sell it here. You mean to sort of get it started with everything we could have now, or if the, sure. if the, if the printed sheet only needs to say school budget, yes or no, yeah. as opposed to having the specifics of whatever we decide? Could the tabulator printer people start that process? Well, the it'll have however the, the, the question is warned. So it'll need that language. <coughs> You're okay with that? Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to want to it. I have, yeah. I have more, I have more stress balls in my office. If you go need right. one, <laughs> I've got buckets of them in there. <laughs> I'm sure it's helping you pay attention. It was. Yeah, I yeah. believe it. Go ahead. Uh, bus station has the priority of the space, or the seems logistically impossible to redo it. Yeah. Yeah, just just yeah. just for the audience. Um, yeah, I, to this, know about it. I know, but it's not. We'll have public comment later. It's this is not not open forum. So sorry for um, I shut that down initially. But I, I I I know I know people have questions. But um, well, the but quick yeah, answer if, is if we make it over forum, we'll we'll be here till till April fifteenth. Uh, <laughs> Jill. So in order to actually even try to do this for the twenty eighth. We'd need to send out, so we would need to make a decision like next week. Yes, yes. It just it feels not possible. I feel like April fifteenth sounds reasonable, or like I said, after we get back from break, I, I don't. I mean, we would have to make a very important decision in a week, and then hot off the presses, get things mailed, have a hand count, so find volunteers to hand count, which will take time. I know it's today's the sixth. I agree. It seems too rushed to me. I think we need to have a good bu budget discussion. Yeah, I would be more comfortable with the 15th as well. Um, so April 15th, we, as far as logistics go, would mean we don't have um, Lost Nation, the auditorium, right? but we would have tabulators. We should have tabulators, okay. yeah. Again, this is all assuming that you all don't take too long to make that decision to go forward with it. Right. Um, yeah, we should talk about what the what yeah. deadline we would have to set for ourselves in order to meet April 15th. So So when would we have to get warm language to uh, Oh, let's see. Well, I'm going to just thumbnail this because I was going through a lot of this in my mind <laughs> earlier today and each time I went through it I came up with a different answer. Um, we need about, if you get three weeks out, we're getting them printed to have the tabulators here, um, getting them mailed, um, then maybe a couple weeks onto that for people to receive the mail and to actually send it back to me if they choose. But so that's about five weeks there. Five Five weeks would be the week of the 15th of April. <laughs> well, there you go. So five weeks, if you moved very quickly on this in this next week, I think, yeah, I think that that works. I think, think of it in terms of bumping it another week, maybe okay. let that, let that be a rolling mm -hmm. five week you need period. Five weeks in order to have I think five weeks and the mailing ballot. Like, I think five weeks there won't, there's a little bit of a margin for error in there too, when something goes wrong, because often there is, mm -hmm. um, not much, but, mm -hmm. but I feel, I feel a lot better about five weeks. Yeah. So even if we wanted April 15th, it sounds like we need to make a decision next, next week. Yeah. Looks like we could do, how do you feel about four weeks? <laughs> oh, wait, you're saying I did this with him earlier. He doesn't like it. <laughs> I mean, because because I think we could have, I mean, I think we could do the budget in two meetings. And so, yeah, if we did it, yeah, we could have an emergency meeting next week and then a regular meeting on the 20th, and probably keep the language by the 21st. And then say we have for the 21st of March. Of March. So you might want to think more about that 30th date then where we could have the auditorium. April 30th. Yeah, April 30th. Sorry. 
which we could do because then because the, the 22nd through the 26th is our April break. Yeah, so people would be back from break would be the yes. 30th. Has the advantage of being something everyone will recognize is this is this is a Montpelier election. And I have a, a weird desire to have it on a Tuesday because elections tend to be on Tuesday. You know, people are used to that. Um, what just He's came up recently where somebody huh? complained about something that wasn't on a Tuesday? Um, I, I I have heard of complaints on that. I, I like the idea of having it on the weekend. I was going to say, could we have it on the weekend too? Is that uh, a possibility? That's... I'd have to check with them. Um, it might have to be although, that Sunday. Although, honestly, like, if it's the end of a vacation, the end of a week, vacation, that that's like, yeah. So it would have to be mm -hmm. the following weekend. What What do people feel? Just uh, we don't have to. Tell, what do people feel about the thirtieth? I think the thirtieth makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Oh, huh? Oh, we have <laughs> Like yeah, yes. calling school for that. Yeah, we're okay. not. I mean, but if we get okay, yeah. fine. We try that. Yeah, right. yeah. I was just wondering. <laughs> just curious. Ask yeah, for a friend. Right. Yeah. Pol not, polls like, are open to seven. Scores at three. No. <laughs> she would support it if we were yeah. gonna. Um, yeah. Well, the first thing I can do um, tomorrow is lock that in. If that's the date you all want to go, I would need to get final confirmation from. Lost um, Nation from Lost Nation, but they are communicated with them again today. So, but I'd still want to lock them in rock solid and let you all know first thing in the morning if yeah. that's the way you want it to go. I just I just say that because I believe in jinxes. So. Yep. I I think we've got. Um, do, do we need to take a vote? Let's do it the thirtieth. I'm not trying to tempt fate, but then just to also understand if there was to be a second vote, we'd be looking at another five weeks out from that. Well, five weeks out from a budget yeah. decision. From a budget. So decision. not five weeks out from April thirtieth. So right. it would be well, because the vote would happen on April thirtieth, right? You'd be right. pushing it. So we would have be a right, budget. okay, and then we'd have to go back and buy. Then we have to do all this again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And when does so, that then we have the hand count, right? <laughs> Yep. So we could we could probably Mid sneak June. in that yep. okay. second. Not tempting fate, just just maybe we could have it on the last day of school. Last day for who? For seniors or for others? <laughs> I, know, I know the seniors are leaving the fourteenth, whether the school's done or not. <laughs> yeah, that's so horrible. Verify <laughs> 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 that. Um, okay. But um, so and we've gotten at least Tammy's backing like yeah. figure it out for Montpelier and she'll we, she'll figure it out. We for chatted Rats, right? and she said that she she could probably do what what I needed to do. So, so we I'll would double check with her too. Yeah. We would then presume that the vote on the school budget would take place on April thirtieth as well in yeah. Roxbury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And that should be plenty of time for her to say I'm the crazy one. She's much more even keel. And we would have to consider because Roxbury also votes at the school in the gym. So, <clears throat> yep. But I did talk to Tammy today too, and she said that you all have been talking yeah. and she's aware and she's got her wheels turning. Yep. She's, uh, she's a good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she knows what she's doing better than I do. So, <laughs> thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> yeah, thanks. This yeah, is sure. Sure. very helpful. Yeah. 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 Very helpful. Absolutely. And I'll give you a call in for it. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. All right, so we're going to ignore the next slide. <laughs> I think there's one other question. Do we know if that contract language existed 10 years ago? I guess I'm just, I, I don't, I don't I know no if that we had to doing that. Yeah. do but the same thing. Joe has heard this whole conversation, and he and I will chat tomorrow about yes. what we want to do. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember the previous vote the last time being that quick, but I've also... It's a while ago. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I don't... So I just want to remind the board that this, um, these are just possibilities mm -hmm. um, based on uh, conversations that our administrative team had a long time ago, based on conversations we've had today. Um, there are some things you won't see in here. You won't see many facilities pieces in here. One of the ironies of last night's vote was that the voters did pass the capital plan for the $270,000 addition for the capital plan that was passed. And so there's a question that I'm not positive the answer to 
is does the board have to abide by that vote or not? Um, so that previously for my plan B was part of plan B. <laughs> it is not, not part not of putting money into the capital plan. Right, right. for next yeah. year. It is now not part of my plan B because of that vote last night. I'm, I don't even know who I asked to get clarity on that, but I'm still thinking about it. Um, so there are things that you won't see in here that you might say, hey, why didn't, or would you consider this? I want to remind the board that the vote happened last night and it's today. So I worked on this today and had, didn't have a whole lot of time to really think a whole lot of things through. Um, so a lot of, well, why didn't you think of this? Won't be, uh, you're going to get in because it was today. <laughs> um, so one possible scenario is that we could cut $700,000 in spending and increase the fund balance contribution by another 575,000. That would make our total fund balance contribution over a million dollars for this budget. We would decrease spending by taking $40,000 from school budget lines, which essentially is a level fund from FY24's budget. So it essentially would say to our school principals um, and central office administrators that you're level funding your budget, however you want to do that. Um, we would eliminate the three permanent substitute positions from Mont the Montpelier schools. The permanent substitute position was not filled in Roxbury this year. And that was part of the elimination from the first round. So it would be eliminating all of the permanent substitute positions from Montpelier schools. And I, I also just want to say that, that there is no way to not hurt in this, in this scenario, in these scenarios, because, um, our permanent substitutes have brought a whole lot of, um, normalcy for our teaching staff in particular, when we have people out, um, we, uh, we, we could do 2.5 FTE from Marissa, which is our instructional assistant unit. We could do three FTE from MREA, the faculty, um, what those positions are. We have a few different ways that the administrative team was thinking about it today. And we did not make, we were not able to come to consensus around what that is. So we still have some more talking to do around that. Eliminate the Roxbury late bus and eliminate Main Street Middle School Montpelier busing. Um, in addition to the cuts that were already made from the first time around. So in doing all of these pieces right here, the potential tax rate increase, assuming that the dollar yield is at $9,775, is still an 18% increase in Montpelier, and it's a 7.4% increase in Roxbury. I will be completely honest with you, based on the um, what happened last night, I don't think an 18% increase in Montpelier will pass. It's just, that's just my opinion. I could be completely and utterly wrong, but that's a whole lot of the cutting to do and you're not getting a whole lot out of it for a tax increase. A completely different scenario um, is that we would cut $1.4 million in spending and increase the fund balance contribution by bringing our Roxbury students to Union Elementary School. So that's the breakdown of where that saving, where that $1.4 million in spending comes from. Um, if we were to do a scenario like this, then the potential tax increase, assuming the dollar yield is at $9,775, the tax increase at Montpelier would be 11.69%. And at Roxbury, it would be 1.63%. A different scenario is that we could do both of those things. If we did both of those things, then that's a $2.1 million cut in spending, a contribution from the fund balance of 575K. And that gets us, oops, sorry, to an 8.21% increase in Montpelier and a negative 1.53 decrease in Roxbury if we were to do both of those slides. So essentially take the stuff out of it, take the bullets out of it. We have to cut our general budget by nearly $3 million to get below 10% increase in taxes. Um, I don't know how to do that if we don't bring Roxbury students to union. And I'll just be perfectly honest about that. That's a significant cut in our budget. Um from an educational standpoint in terms of what you feel would be in the best interest of the kids in the classroom what you feel would have the least impact on your programming and your ability to give 
kids the education that they want, which of those three slides do you feel has the less direct impact on kids and the educational services you and your administration want to provide? Could you speak up a little bit? Sure. He, he asked which, which, is, which has the least uh, impact on the educational services that we can provide. Um, of the three scenarios. Of the three scenarios. I can say that um, the first scenario with the, basically those cuts are essentially, with the exception of the Roxbury late bus, all come from Montpelier schools. Um, with, the, with the first scenario alone, systematically that has this tremendous impact on our system because the people who do those jobs already are important to our systems. Um, and one of the major conversations that we had earlier was how do you break up those, particularly the MREA positions, because some MREA positions may not influence a significant number of students on a daily basis because their caseloads are very small because of the supports they're giving students. However, um, there are oftentimes are students who need the most support. Um, and so then when you flip it and we said, okay, so which positions may not be working with students with the most needs, um, then you're going into fine arts and music, essentially, um, which is not something anybody wants to do either. So there's no good scenario there for um, programming and what we want to offer for kids. And uh, when you look at bringing Roxbury to Union Elementary School, am I confident that the kids at Roxbury would have an excellent education at Union Elementary School? Absolutely. I would send my own kids to Union Elementary School in pretty much any classroom there because they're wonderful. Um, and the experience is wonderful at Union Elementary School. And I can hear the Roxbury community. I understand that that, that is the, the center of their community. Um, I think that there's part of that challenge and debate is that there's a logic to it. It's logical to bring Roxbury students to union as a cost saver and, and that it doesn't have an educational impact necessarily on the kids from Roxbury, if we're talking educational impact. Um, and there's an emotional argument that logic loses to emotion pretty much every time. So um, that's a, that's a really tricky scenario. However, I am, quite positive that my colleagues at Union Elementary School would provide a wonderful education, um, just as we've heard tonight from Roxbury families that Main Street Middle School provides a wonderful education to students from Roxbury as well. Question. Um, I know Scott has his hand. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, he had his hand, but. Mine's been an old hand. Been an old, old hand? hand. Oh, All right, right mine's here. a new hand. Um, <laughs> I think it was the summer, maybe before I was on the board, or it might have been the summer before, um, that there was a staffing issue at Roxbury mm -hmm. where there was like a last minute yep. attempt to hire somebody for some grade. Last year, last summer. Actually, um, it's happened every year, pretty much, but last summer was worse. I feel like, you know, with Roxbury in a tenuous situation, if that would happen again, it might be even harder to fill it. We are we are predicting that just alone, just with this conversation alone, with this whole budget season alone, Roxbury will be in a tenuous situation with staffing again. So that, you know, and, and in that thing that I'm describing that I wasn't here for um, was was bringing the union, uh, bringing the Roxbury students to union considered as a backup if, if yes. that position couldn't be filled? Our grades three, four, because that was the position that couldn't be filled. That it, I mean, it could be an eventuality anyway, given okay. what's going on. I do want to stress that um, the way our contract, the way a union contract is, and I know most people know this, but sometimes it's hard when emotional, emotions start running high the way our union contract is, is run is that there's a seniority list that we have um, and there is no Roxbury versus Montpelier on that seniority list. It's an MRPS seniority list. And so um, what we look at is licensure area and where people were hired within that licensure area. So if the board decided to close Roxbury Village School, it wouldn't be like the Roxbury Village School teachers no longer have a job at MRPS. It's based on seniority. 
Um, and so most of them would be, um, most of the classroom teachers would be folded into the openings that are already happening at Union. Oh, so the, the, the rifts that would happen would be the newest teachers yes. by um, area. And it, regardless of what school, it's just the youngest, that are not necessarily youngest, but the newest teachers. Yes. And because of resignations and other rifts we've already planned, there would be no, like there would be a place for everybody. And those would be lateral moves in terms yeah. of the yeah. position. Yeah, as of right now. Mm -hmm. Libby, can you really quickly, can you repeat what you just said? Because maybe I misunderstood it. And I think it's an important one. Uh, yeah, so because we're under a union contract, um, there is no employee here who's a Roxbury Village School employee or a Union Elementary School employee or a Main Street Middle School employee. It's based on their licensure category and everybody is placed in a licensure category. Um, and then you're basically ordered in terms of your date of hire. Um, and so if there are rifts that with no resignation, so we, we're not filling, you know, if there's a resignation and a riff, then the person who's riff moves into that resignate that position. You know, we just don't hire for that position. They just have rights to it already. Um, I like to think of it as the union owns those positions and licensure areas. So um, people would just slide over into um, Union Elementary School, if they're a K-6 edu educator, for instance, um, openings that are already there. I have two questions. Well, One. really quickly, I thought I heard you just say that given the, the current known resignations that n no current teachers would would be rift only positions that are, don't won't have a person in them next year no not no no um teacher positions um classroom teachers because part-time employees are are placed on their salaries or on the seniority scale based on their part-time equivalency um and roxbury has a lot of part-time employees for specials for instance uh, and, and most of those people are on the lower end of the seniority category. Okay, thank you. I have to remember my two questions. <laughs> um, one is, um, so when, when RIFs are made, is there any consideration of competence? No. Okay, that's a little scary. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> um, and then um, uh, go ahead because I need to remember my second question. Oh, I think Laura had a question. I was confused about slide six. Um, are the the bullets under like the supply, salary, and benefits? Are those oh. cuts related to like? Would that like go with busing students to you? Yes, or like, yeah, they would. Okay. Yeah. So if you add those numbers up, they come to around one point four million dollars. And so those are positions of of like employees at RVS yeah. positions because we wouldn't the supplies would already be in unions, like they'd move into unions, so we wouldn't have those those budget lines anymore. Um. So uh, it'd be supplies, salaries, and benefits. That's about what it equals to. Um, <clears throat> to piggyback on that. So are there costs associated with sending RVS students to UES? I see that these are the things like these costs, you know, would no longer be line items, but in terms of transportation or special education, are there any costs that you can name or have explored that are associated with sending students? From no, RBS because to we already send a bus. We already have a middle school and high school bus, so the kids would jump on that bus, and, and there's, there's plenty of quick capacity on that bus. Those buses hold 75 kids. Okay. Yeah. So they would jump on that bus, um, and we'd have a full bus now instead of a quarter full bus. So you had K through 12. Yeah. One bus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they. So we already have the transportation baked in. I would suggest to the board, if the board were to go with a decision like this, that we keep the late bus. 
except the late bus primary responsibility would be to pick up kids from part two in Union and bring them back to Roxbury. So it'd be like a six o'clock. There would be no like 6.37.30 late bus, you know, it would be a 5.30, 6 o'clock for the, to prioritize kids who go to part two. And I think currently the East Roxbury, like the first pickup is at 6.30 in the morning. So we would be talking about kindergarten, potentially aged students getting on a bus at 6.30 in the morning and traveling for an hour, hour and 10 minutes to get to UES. I don't know how Stacy, who's our bus coordinator, yeah. would change the routes. Right. In any way. I mean, there could potentially, I, I don't know, because I yeah. don't do this part. This is like the most yeah. convoluted job in the world. Yeah. But um, there could be if people drop kids off at Roxbury Village School so that they could leave later, you know, mm -hmm. and have one common pickup, mm -hmm. you know, or a, at a safe space. Yeah. For kids that might be an option they choose. But I don't, I don't want anybody yeah. to put me on that because it's not my decision to make. But it, yeah. but Stacy and her team and yeah. Tatum would would be working with that. I think I am also thinking about wellness, readiness to learn, and the prospect of a five-year-old being on a bus for an hour and 10 minutes um, feels impossible um, in terms of that student's ability to come into a classroom. But I know that these are details and this is, but I'm just- The detail and it's that. also something that's very common in Vermont. Yeah. An hour and 10 minutes. Yes. I think we heard an average of 45 minutes from yeah. Tina last time. This is Tina's sort of, you know, uh, rogue research and I recall it. Thank you. Um, but it, that's not and... uncommon. Uh -huh. I will say, um, my child is not five and I recognize that but yeah. to go the four miles from his high school to my house is an hour and 45 minutes. I get it. The way that, yeah, have to exactly. Get the <laughs> exactly. You are on the route. Yeah. Um, sure. I would be interested in learning about possibilities to minimize bus time, e including spending more money on more transportation options. Um, an hour and 10 minutes, even though it may not be unusual for Vermont, I think it's too long for a five-year-old. Um, so another bus, a van, <laughs> some logistical changes, even if they do cost money to minimize that. And it seems like the, how many coming there are there, like four? It seems like um, they can be identified. And for next year, we have three. Three, I mean. We're four lined up yeah. right now, but it's only. I mean, it seems so like for three people, you can identify who they are and try to make their situation. So um, I don't want kids waiting outside for a bus in the dark. You I know, think I'm going to just put a time out because this is not the conversation yeah. we need to have right now. Because you're not making the decision right now, yeah. right? You're okay, looking yeah. at what, like what the board, you, what really the board should be thinking about right now is what's the tax increase you think you can pass and how are you going to get there? Um, not necessarily busing kids. So I just, to echo what Jamie said back at the beginning, I was sort of preparing for tonight and this is not an isolated conversation that we're having here in MRPS that 29 out of the 93 school budgets that were voted on yesterday failed. So that's about 30% of all school budgets. Mm -hmm. So while this is incredibly painful and this is our problem to solve, it also reflects a statewide message and challenge to our lawmakers about how our education funding works. And I think that this sort of 30% of budgets being I remember in 2014 when a whole lot went down after Act 46, and apparently that was only 14% of budgets were voted down. And this is 30% of budgets. So I'm hoping our lawmakers are listening. I, I know they're aware of the challenges because I spend a lot of time over there, but um, that this system is not tenable for Vermonters anymore and that school boards across the state are having to have this exact same conversation. Um, I also read, and I think it was VT Digger, that health insurance alone makes up $42 million of that increase. And so um, again, this is just to put in context about how little control the school boards have over these spending and frankly, the property tax system, right? I was in Florida last week in a small high school in central Florida and they had every possible everything for their students. I went to a softball game and they have all kinds of things. And the reason is there are places that in the rest of the country that if you have the means, you can do all kinds of boosters and all kinds of things you can do to bring money into your school. But Vermont has made a commitment that we're all responsible for educating all of our students. And I say that because I think what I saw is that even if we did these like drastic decimating cuts to our district, both 
in staffing and in buildings, we still will have an 8% increase for Montpelier yeah. voters. So even with like really just ripping, ripping this whole district to shreds, we're going to have an 8% increase. And that's um, a little heartbreaking. Oh, it's a lot heartbreaking. Um, so I just, I, I just wanted to kind of provide that bigger context um, because I know we wrestled with some of our budget decisions in the last several months. And it was really tough to see that, oh, even if we made some pretty substantial changes, the tax rate implication was still not that great. So, um, you know, I think the legislature really needs to readdress this. I know they're well aware of the problem. I know we need more housing. We need people who can actually afford to come here and live here and share in the property tax burden. But a lot of the, um, a lot of the financial pressures that are on us and 29 other districts plus the six or eight, however, didn't even vote because they postponed their vote um, is out of our control. Um, so I just hope that our voters understand that even if we rip things to shred, there will be an 8% increase in our taxes. And that is not something we can, we don't have that much control over. These much that, you know, we shouldn't, and no one should be surprised by it. I mean, that was the full intent of Act 127. Montpelier in, in the minds of the legislature has been getting a benefit for since Act 60 by the pupils being misweighted. They corrected it and they wanted to do it all in one year. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm frankly shocked that everyone is so surprised by what's going on because it, it's all engineered. Yeah. I think one of the challenges and this gets off topic too is that even districts that Act 127 so Supported because they got more weights, benefited, failed yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so why? Why is that happening? Franklin Northeast failed yesterday. Like they were one of the biggest beneficiaries of it. So it's there's there's questions to be had there <laughs> that yeah. speaks to what's happening, you know. Yeah, and I'm yeah, you know, I, I think all that's really valid and important to keep in mind. I also think that there are things that the board could do. There's there's a big difference in people's budgets, in people's ability to pay for piano lessons, to buy groceries, to do the things they need to do between a 24% increase and a 12% increase. And there's a very substantial difference between a 24% increase and an 8% increase. And I think we need to deliver, I think we need to keep pushing the legislature really for, I think, some major changes in how we fund education. I think the fact that a lot of these factors are out of our control does not excuse us from making tough decisions of things that are in our control that I think can make a real difference in the cash flow of people's houses. And I think from what I'm hearing, we have some decisions that might be very tough that may, may help people out and may not have big long-term educational impacts and things that we can work on and work with, I mean, tough as they may be, they're there. I had one more thought, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't get this earlier. Okay. Is there any way to know what our budget would look like next year? I remember Emma was trying to say this. <laughs> You're killing me, Joe. Because, <laughs> you know, there, there, this, if we just, if one of the speakers earlier is like, if we just have to keep doing this every year, we have to make some we have to make some big decisions and try to be as strategic as we can because I don't think the legislature is going to save the day with the yield. And I don't think Act 127 is going to change a third time. Maybe it will. So I think one of the changes, one of the significant um, con contributors to the FY25 increase is because the, the board quite right, rightly negotiated a much higher salary increase for our teachers and our instructional assistants um, that was well deserved. and that's part of our, that's part of one of our pressures. And we will be going into negotiations again with both of those units. Um, and I think we have to get creative with our partners in those units around how do we, how do we create high quality contracts that may not necessarily have the monetary increase that they got in the last contract negotiation. That was a big part of the pressure that we're facing right now. I thought of my second question, um, and that is in terms of absorbing students from Roxbury, um, space and teachers and support staff, like 
do we need the entire staff from Roxbury to make that happen? And is there room at Union for more classrooms? So or? I've analyzed our class size policy and the numbers that we have currently at Union and at Roxbury. And yes, we can those, those we can fit the kids in Union. And still have a little room. Um, the slide six, it says, uh, the busing to UES, it says the increase the fund balance contribution by 575,000. That's in addition to what was the original fund balance contribution, 475,000. And we have 1.6 million in the fund balance. Um, after the 4.75, 4, 475. So, so that still, that still leaves another 400,000, um, it actually leaves about a million. Yeah. Because the one point six is 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 considering that we are already going to use oh, okay. four seventy five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So there's a there's a million dollars in our fund balance, and originally, the response to using that was we need to save it for our cliff when the five percent cap goes away. The five percent cap has gone away. Now, why are we not using that? I mean, so and 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 because. The, what what's happening is a kick in the teeth to Roxbury when that's available. And this is a partnership. It's going to continue to be a partnership unless some really dramatic changes happen. It's going to be tough to have a successful partnership when you've been kicked in the teeth. It's not enough. I know, but so we'd have about, I think, it, I think if I remember correctly, it was like $800,000 because you have a policy that says you have to have a, a certain amount in there. And so I believe that was about 800,000 left. There's other legislation that's pressuring the schools. So we've put about, a, this would put about a million in from the fund balance in, which was way more than we expected. And um, another $800,000 would eliminate any use of that fund balance going forward. Um, it wouldn't decrease the tax rate considerably, it would decrease it, but not considerably. If we just use that, let's just say we just use that. Um, and we also have other legislation around PCBs that has not been paused. This building was built at the time when PCBs were used in the caulking. We are expecting it to have PCBs in it. What, was at, the, what is the cost of building a new school in Burlington? It's like 26, 28 million dollars. It has to go to bond. If, it, if there's a high PCB level, $1 million is not going to do anything. It's not going to do that's, anything. That's, that's not true. They, my understanding is that U32, it depends on the level. The way that the Burlington High School was constructed, it was particularly toxic and unusually toxic. Like U32 has some PCBs. It's going to be a pretty modest modification that, you know, they're, they're not going to have to rebuild that building. Did the state pass the PCB testing? Uh, they're talking about the house that is trying to get it through, but then they've put some money yeah. aside. That money's already spent by North Country yeah. and, or will be spent by North Country and the other buildings that found PCBs and I think Brattleboro and Burlington. Yeah, but I understand that like, PCBs does not mean you have to tear around your building. Burlington was a unique case. You have to do remediation, but most buildings were not built the way the Burlington High School was built. And, and we will have to pay for it. Yeah, and we'll have to pay for it. Go ahead. And, and I think it was more like 60 million for for yeah. yeah. Known by the public? No, like, has the legislature said that this is PCB remediation is the school responsibility? That, that's <laughs> the funding it, or what's the. Yes and no. Uh, so they put aside some funds for the. Um, for remediation mitigation that's going to be used up by the people who have already been found over the limits that the legislator set legislation set they have no other fund for that nor are they thinking of any so they're trying as jake said the house ed committee is trying to put legislation forward to pause the testing um, indefinitely until there's a funding source for it that can be found um, it's my understanding the Senate Education Committee is not interested in taking that up, but I could be proven wrong. And until we do have signed legislation, we're going to have to assume that that 
I mean, we can cross our fingers. The day I got the letter from MSMS and UES that we had no PCBs in there, I did a little whoop and holler and I would do the same thing here. Um, but until we know for sure that they're pausing that legislation, we have to be mindful of it because of when this building was built. And I forgot that we went, yeah, I know it's in, like in a year or so. When is our testing coming up? Spring. Okay, this year. Spring. I believe. This year, yeah. Oh, I thought it was until 2025. I thought it was a year later. Andrew too. told me. Yeah, Andrew told me. Maybe it's Roxbury that's in the spring, but we're not concerned about Roxbury because of when it was built. So then it's 2025. What fiscal year will we expect the house remediation? 26. Okay. But largely it's going to need, we'll have to, it probably wouldn't be something, certainly correct me if I'm wrong, Libby, that we would include in a budget in the way that it's like a budget line item. It's more like it's, we should make sure to have our savings account pretty full in order to use that kind of money and or capital plan money. I guess it just depends on how much it would cost. Yeah, we have to have money accessible. And that's not to say or scare anybody. And the board could say, don't worry, we'll worry about that bridge when we cross it. Sure. That's your prerogative to do. Um, but it, it's a reality that we have on our plates that my colleagues who are going through it right now can tell you it's not fun and it's not inexpensive. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just say my own opinion is it doesn't make sense to me to just go ahead and use all of our savings this year to um drive to drive down tax increases without reopening our budget and actually looking at what could we continue to take out of it that we didn't originally consider um and i know we're not making that decision tonight and we've given ourselves um a couple more weeks to make that decision so i fully understand libby why things like you know facilities or other like transportation stuff isn't in the presentation you have for us tonight. And I guess what I'm requesting is if there are other options that you could continue to consider that would be included on what you have for slide five. Um, things like, I'm looking at the um, presentation you gave to us on November 29th where you had those three pie charts and transportation was a very significant amount of idea number three, for example, and facilities was a fairly significant amount. I can't remember if that slice of the pie included not, in, not contributing to the capital plan or if it was actually from the facilities line item, but my recollection is we, after that meeting, when we had new information <laughs> from the state, we reduced the amount that we were gonna cut from facilities. So. I would I I would appreciate seeing a few other options um, the next time we meet. So there is no more transportation there. We learned when Roxbury's afternoon bus couldn't run or but morning bus couldn't run rather mm -hmm. the amount of people who rely on that because they don't have automobiles. That's so that's off the table. Okay. Um, I Union Elementary School busing has been around forever. The board wants me to find out how much that is. I can. I would recommend against it. Yeah. Um, so that is the transportation that's okay. available to the board. I think, in my opinion, you can tell me to do something else. Um, the the capital fund was a major. If that if that if you saw a major number in facilities, that would be the capital fund. Okay. Um, that was like four thousand years ago in my brain, so I'm not, yeah. <laughs> not remembering exactly. And it's it's not a dollar amount here on this slide. Yeah, if it was a big piece of a pie chart, then that included the capital plan. Um, we can certainly look at deferring maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, we we absolutely could do that. I would recommend thinking hard and long about that. But we could. I did not have a chance to go into Andrew's budget today or have a conversation with Andrew today around his facilities piece. I don't think we, we'll put it this way, the amount of money we're looking at in order to get a lower tax increase is pretty significant. And yeah, I could probably get Andrew to find, you know, maybe up to $100,000 or something, but it's it's not gonna replace full bullets, right? Yeah. 
And I think you're right, sure, Lydia, sure. you talked about we don't want elementary kids walking right. down Berlin Street or from Town Hill Road down to the elementary school. I mean, that's just not realistic. Well, and there are elementary, there are kids in Montpelier who live on a, who, who ride the bus for almost an hour because that's how far they live. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm good. Two clarifying questions. Can you just, maybe I spaced out and missed this part, probably did. Can you clarify why in both these plans <clears throat> we're increasing the fund balance contribution? So I don't have, so we don't have to cut as much. So that the 575 when talking with Christina um, was the, who apologizes, she's not here today, she's on vacation. Um, the 575 was what she and I both felt okay-ish putting towards more. So we had to cut less. Yes. Um, the other thing I want to point out about the fund balance that I didn't say earlier was that, that money next time. this is the last time that we've, you've rather encumbered yeah. money for a budget. So for the past four or so, well, as long as I've been superintendent, I feel like there's been a $400,000 allotment encumbered from the fund balance that go, was supposed to go as a revenue source in each year's budget that this is FY25 was the last year the board had encumbered any money. So there is no more encumbrance going forward from the fund balance. Yeah, and if we use all the fund balance, that's money that we have to find next budget cycle. I don't understand. And Say yeah. again? I don't understand what you said. The encumbrance part? Right. So the board can, in, when the money goes into the fund balance, which is like our savings account, you know, money we don't spend at the end of the year, and it grew significantly through COVID, quite honestly. Um, we got a lot of federal support and we didn't use as much, you know, we didn't have a substitute teacher for a year and a half, for instance. Um, so the fund balance grew considerably um, and the board can what's called encumber that money for a reason. And when, you, when the board votes to encumber it, that means that that money is essentially taken out of that savings account and put as a hold um, until, you spend it for that reason. Like escrow, um, right? Yeah. Hmm? Escrow? Yeah. I could, yeah. A little. Yeah. Kind of. Sure. <laughs> so for the past several years, I've been superintendent, this is my six year superintendent, my sixth budget se season. We have had um, a planned encumbrance of $400,000 in our fund balance each year. So the board has said, we're going to put $400,000 towards our next year's budget as a revenue source to bring down the the education spending. Um, sometimes the board has used the four four hundred thousand, and sometimes you haven't had to because other because in that year we didn't spend all the money you know that we planned on spending. Um, so sometimes we continue to put money back into the fund balance because we didn't need, we didn't use that money whether it was we didn't fill a position or whatever. Does that make more sense? What's, what's changing though? So the board had planned that you, they planned it ahead of time. Right, so they had it planned through FY25, the budget year FY25, which is what we're trying to revote on now um, for $400,000. There is no more encumbered money. So for the fund, for the budget revenue source. So moving forward, you'd have to encumber it again. Um, with this kind of contribution, which is about a million dollars, you'd have probably about $800,000 left to, put me on that exact amount, but I believe it's about $800,000 left. So if you encumbered another 400,000 for FY26, then you're cutting that in half of usable money. So I'm, I'm not sure if I'm putting words in Rhett's mouth or if I actually heard Rhett um, uh, allude to this, um, but is it not true that over the last five or six budget periods, um, our district benefited from Roxbury being a part of it and thus contributed to the increase in fund balance accumulated over the last uh, five or six years. I can't answer that, Scott, because I don't, the fund balance isn't like how it's, how the money goes into the fund balance isn't diff isn't uh, differentiated by school. No. So I couldn't. Uh, yeah, I understand. I understand that, but you met, you made the point that it, that COVID contributed, and it was the same time period. 
right? And so I just, I, I think it's important to recognize that the, the things that contributed to our budget, including COVID and including the benefit that we got because of the merger with Roxbury, right, should, should all be mentioned, not just some of them. I'm not, I'm yeah, I'm not sure that's totally, totally accurate. I mean, I, I, I think both districts in some ways benefited from the merger. I think that's, that's true. I mean, both districts got a, you know, a, a discounted tax rate for four years. That's probably what he's referring to. Yeah. yeah. I don't think that, that counted into the fund balance because when we, planned our budgets we planned with that you know that 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 revenue that that was part of our revenue calculations and our, our tax calculation i mean our fund balance is largely because you know frankly we we had some windfalls and we did some over budgeting i, I mean the, the fund balance happens when they say you plan for a teacher and you plan for a hundred thousand and then they come in and they opt for, or you, you know, you hire someone who's more junior than you anticipated, and then they don't have a family, so they don't take the family plan. Yeah. And then you, you know, you're the hundred thousand dollars that you budget, you get thirty five back. Um, we were just lucky for several years. Yeah. I, yeah. Thank you, Jim, for that explanation. Again, I still think that w we over budgeted as a result of that fact that our tax rates were were less impacted because of the merger. No? No, I just don't think it's as direct of a I don't line think it's as direct as that. that. It's not like we were saying, oh, we have a six cent tax um, uh, discount. So therefore we're gonna put more money into the budget. We made, the, we, we created the budget that we needed at the time. And then if we didn't actually end up hiring for a certain teaching position, um, then we could save that money. Or like Jim said, if somebody didn't choose the more expensive health plan, we could yeah. save that money. So I just don't think it's as direct of a, a connection as that. I, I guess I disagree. I mean, we've, we've been talking about positions that we've budgeted in Roxbury that have not been filled. So that money that was budgeted was not going to pay for staffing in Roxbury. So it was going into our fund balance. So I, I agree that it's not a like direct, um, you know, impact. But but I think it's naive to say that it, that it is not due to that at all. I, to be clear, though, there that's only been one position this past school year. So it's been the point. With the only position that hasn't been filled in Roxbury in the past six years that I've been here is 0 0.5 3K for FY24. Which is not a one point five million dollar position, right? Well, and maybe this is a detail that's not as important, but that tax discount ended in FY twenty three, right? It was, yeah, it was. I think it was FY twenty three. By FY twenty three, it was small. I mean, it, it started like large and by it went. It it was gradually decreasing. Yeah. Anyway, it's over. It's over. It has ended. It has ended. It's ended then for a couple of years and. You know, the, it hasn't been significant since 2020. Uh, and I also, I mean, I want to, I, I do want to give a little bit of the, the history with, because I was on, on the committee. I mean, all we agreed to was to keep the school open for four years. And if you look at the agreement, there was a very distinct reason that the board can close it. Because if you look at other merger agreements, like for instance, Wash Central, the towns have approval. And I think it was very much contemplated at the time that it was a small school with a difficult to sustain model. I think there was hope that it would continue. I think there was a nod of knowledge that it was a difficult school to sustain. And the reason that the, the power was vested with the board and not the towns is because we knew it would be a difficult thing for Roxbury to close, honestly. And and that was pretty evident at the time. And that's why the agreement was structured the way that it was structured. Um, and I know that's a tough thing to say, and I'm seeing nods from Nancy and Tina who are also in the room. Uh, that is why we structured it that way. I get it. Right. I guess. And both towns agreed to that. 
Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it's out of the box decision. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think from what I'm told and based on the experience of families that are in all three schools, including RBS, not UES, um, yet, um, is that they're having really good experiences. And when compared to surrounding districts, they're happy with the experiences that they're having. Um, a rushed process is certainly not anyone's desire. Um, no, it's not, it's, it's, it's not. And we added a lot of positions with ESSER funds that we folded into our budget. Um, and those are what replaces the RBS line item. Um, Not necessarily, because we had budget cuts to go with those uh, those positions. As we moved people from our ESSER into local budget, we had decreases to match it for almost every position except for one, maybe two. And that was not just this year, right? Libby? Right. That's been happening across the last three years because we knew our professor was going away. So we've been doing that um, consistently. And those positions add to this experience that people are happy to be having that and probably that surrounding districts don't have. Yeah, no, and those positions have enabled us to really give, I think, the social and emotional support. And, and the, academic support. And academic yeah. support. That... I just feel compelled to mention right now, obviously, this is very loaded and it's very emotional. And as we, wow. we kind of use language like unsustainable and things like that, I just want to say that the experience that students and teachers, I believe, are having at RBS right now are really positive. And there's a lot of really wonderful things happening there right now and a lot of community building and a lot of connecting. And many kids feel that RBS is their home away from home. And 80%, I don't know, of RBS kids arrive at 7.30, 8 o'clock and they leave at five o'clock because we are largely a working class community where families need to tap into the after school care program that we have. I just feel compelled. I know teachers are probably listening or are going to listen later and I want them to know that they are deeply loved and appreciated and they are doing an excellent job. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we're also careful with our language because we're talking about current work that people are doing every day. And we are dropping our kids off to kid, to people who love them, care for them, root for them every single day. And it is so meaningful to us. I have a head cold and I'm emotional. So pardon, but um, I just want to make sure that we're also acknowledging that. I'm not saying you're not, but the, when we say things like unsustainable, it can just feel like a dig and, and maybe that's factual. I just feel compelled. I want to send the word out to those folks and to our families to make sure they know and that all of you know that that is the current lived experience in Roxbury of the school. No, and I, I, I didn't mean to undermine any of that. I, and I, I know there's fantastic work doing, and I know- uh, And great uh, games know, underway, which I'm, yeah, I think we'll see. And I know Shannon Miller is doing a great job. I know the staff is doing a great job. I think you can have people doing great work and giving a great experience in a model that is, is hard to maintain. Absolutely. For, for I just want to make sure too for the public knowledge, because I think sometimes there is some yeah. derogatory language uh, used toward Roxbury. I want to make sure that from my direct experience that I am living on a day-to-day -day basis, I just want to make sure that that record is very clear yes. and what the experience is at that school right now. And from a mathematical perspective, um, you know, it looks like Roxbury Village costs a lot more per student, but Act 127 acknowledged that sparsely populated areas and small schools. We, you know, we don't get it. We don't get it. I know. I know that. <laughs> you, know, you know that. Too. That's the problem. We, they, that. we don't. We don't receive it. We all understand it. But you know, if if Roxbury was analyzed on its own, then the cost per pupil would be comparable. I don't. I haven't figured it out, but it would be probably comparable to what we spend at Union. But because the demographics are all blended together, it doesn't work out, and and that's that's a flaw in the law. It is, and that doesn't go unrecognized in Roxbury. It's a really tough one to swallow mm -hmm. that we are bringing a particular demographic 
particular statistics that we do not maybe RVS doesn't directly reap the benefits for. It's not to say that those benefits couldn't be folded in and they couldn't be um, realized, uh, you know, in, in a UES setting. However, that is a really, and I think it's a really unique um, fallout of 127 because I don't think we saw a lot of mergers with like such tale of two city demographics that came together. You know I mean? I think that's out there, but this is really unique in that we were only two communities. The, the demographics were quite disparate and, um, and it's it's an unintended yet again consequence of 127. So, I just want to go back to the bigger picture and what the because what our administration has proposed here. That on my shoulders. They don't. We <laughs> deserve any rap. We did get a very clear message yesterday. Um, I I assumed that the city budget would also struggle. The city budget did not struggle. The school budget was thoroughly rejected. So I do feel like we spent the last months trying to find some machination and I'm as guilty of it as I, I'm more guilty of it than anyone about complaining about the legislature. But the reality is that this board has a very acutely painful problem right now. And if we don't do something substantial, we're either going to kick the can down the road and have to do that again next year and the year after and the year after, or our budget is going to get voted down again and we're going to be decimated and back here. So I don't, I think, and I, it, this pains me as someone who was a big proponent of the track and our students experiences. And I'm a Montpelier property taxpayer too. I get it. I'm the director of property tax and say, I really get it. It's not fun. Um, but I, I do feel like we were given um, a pretty strong message for better or worse um, in the budget not passing. I do think, I hope that a lot of that was also directed at as part of this 30% of school budgets being voted down as a message to lawmakers. But meanwhile, we have, we have to do two, three it. weeks to come up with something that we think has a chance of passing. I'm not even sure if 18% still being an increase um, would, would pass um, our Montpelier voters, I don't know. So I just wanted to get back to like big picture. We have like not a lot of time. Speaking of it, you did say there would be a second budget, but yeah. um, public comment period. Yes, <laughs> it's 9 p.m. I, I was expecting this to go long. I do want to honor that. Um, I, I, given that we have a longer time frame with our talk with John than I thought, uh, there will be other opportunities to come out of the book. I think what we're going to do Tonight is to hold on to is to give hope, hopefully Libby some direction for what to present. I think what we probably want to see. I'm assuming we're going to want a meeting sometime next week, um, and then our, our meet on the twentieth. We'll probably make a decision. Uh, so the, our our timeline is not as as. Uh, quite as tight. it's not quite as compressed as we originally thought. So with that, I, I do want to honor the, the public comment. I, I would like to say, if you think you can hold off till next time, hold off till next time. If you can keep your comments brief, keep your comments brief. Um, but I do want to honor that. And if, if you can, it's nine o'clock, I think you can hold your, your thoughts till later. Um, you probably won't get a ton of complaints, but we certainly want to hear, hear your voice. Uh, but we, we have more time to hear your voice than we thought we did. Uh, so with that, I, Tim, and then. Well, I just, do we want to give direction to what we want to see? When do we want to after public comment? That's fine. Yeah. I, I think it might be good to just get a flavor of the public comment yeah, first true. and then yeah. tell, tell, tell how other people feel. Because it seems like we've already kind of made our, our minds and people might feel they have a little less influence. Um, Morgan and Tim and getting your name right now. Ben, Ben, Joe, uh, Suzette. Suzette. Anyone else online? Just Tim Sinnett. Tim Sinnett. And because it is late, I'm going to open it up for two more minutes. If you don't get in two more minutes, I'm not going to keep at it because I want to know the amount so I can give times. Check. We have, three, we have three people online. Anyone else online? 
please raise your hand and get the queue. Anyone else in the room? I, I counted about five. If you could, I'm not going to time you, but if you could try to keep your remarks to about a minute, that would be hugely appreciated. Um, so whoever wants to go first in the room, please do. So I'm Suzette Ballard, and um, I'm a Montpelier resident and um, have some experience in education. So, sorry, I looked through you the last time I was here. I just wanted to suggest to you that as you face all of these um, decisions and how complicated it is, and I really do understand how complicated it is, that your communication, um, you started to talk about a communication piece being in one of the, your committees, that that be right next to every single decision that you make. How are you gonna communicate that to the public? You know, the fact that you can, you know, take a million dollars off and you're getting only down to 18, percent you know what what is what is one percent how much money do you have to cut from your budget to get one percent three million is going to only get you to eight so you know what are all the things that you really need to, to um, help the community understand and the whole traditional part about all that stuff that's not in your control and um, the legislature's fumbling <laughs> but it's not a time to blame but it is a time to let people know what is really going on. And I think also the board has, and Jim, you alluded to this earlier, that you do have a responsibility to advocate for this community at the legislative level. And whether that becomes a piece of your commu um, committee structure going forward in this particular time is something to consider. But I do think you have that, that responsibility. So I got to see you at the next meeting. <laughs> Uh, uh, whoever wants to step up next, please do. Hi, everyone. Joe Carroll, uh, president of the Montpelier Roxbury Educators Association. I'll be quick. I'll respect that boundary, Jim. Uh, the first thing is the notice of riffing everyone. I just can't stress enough would be a really, it would be really hard to be a teacher while that happened. And I think that would throw the system into turmoil. And I know Libby was implying that, so I'm not trying to impugn what she said. I'm just merely underscoring that. That would be really hard for all the teachers during the hiring season. I I'm sure it would drive many of them to school spring. And once you're on school spring, the openings that are there, just you would see turnover. And I don't think we wanna be contemplating that this year. I wanted to provide more context about the raises. While they were generous relative to previous years, and we appreciate the board's cooperation to that end, we're still 14th out of 20 schools in Washington County for our base salary and 12th out of 20 for our max salary. And given the cost of living and the healthcare increases, many teachers just didn't see significant raises. Those two things, the latter of which are outside your control. I'm just providing context that even though relative to previous years, they were generous, we're still uh, trying to claw our way up that ladder. Um, regarding risks and evaluations and competence, I hear what you said, Lynn, and that's true. Uh, strictly speaking, it's only on seniority, but there are mechanisms for teachers to be evaluated, deemed incompetent, and then either sent on an improvement cycle or not renewed. Um, I know statutory requirements make uh, admin cuts not possible for all the admin, and Libby, you and I have talked about that, but it doesn't feel great that even though there are some admin that are subject to being rift, as it were, uh, that's off the table this year, especially as we contemplate more teachers and more other educators being rift. I, I think that's worth the board's attention in future years. I'm not deprecating the work that the administrators do in any way, shape, or form, but they cost a lot more than teachers. And in order to bear these cuts equitably, I think we should all be considering that down the road. And last but not least, um, the budget failed 55 to 45. I wonder if a smaller cut, not going down to say 10%, I wonder if a smaller cut would sway some of the middle or the road voters. That's a guess. I have no uh, evidence for that, but I wonder how many could truly be swayed with just a smaller cut, not a, as catastrophic a cut as going down to 10%. Thank you. I spoke fast. I'm sorry. wanted to honor the boundary. Okay. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll go. So my name is uh, Ben Pincus, I'm a graduate of Roxbury Village School, and um, one minute I took about a half hour's worth of notes here, so I'll try to be concise and do 60 seconds. Um, just a couple of things, just this morning I spoke to two teachers at 
RVS and um, just checked in and apologized for what happened with the Montpelier uh, school budget getting voted down. And they said they loved the school. They gave great feedback on the principal, um, on the gains, academic gains made since COVID. And I mentioned that one um, really cruel voice, hard-hearted voice in Montpelier was like, oh, well, you know, just so you know, um, she said to me, most likely September comes around and the teachers won't be there. And I mentioned that to these two teachers and they were pretty upset. They looked at each other and say, we want to be there. They love the school. And, um, and I want to say that the school, the heart of the school is the children. I shouldn't be testifying. The children should be testifying. The teachers too. Um, and talking about what it means to go to our Roxbury Village School. I went to Roxbury Village School when it was a two-room schoolhouse. And I think I mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning that the small rural school is something, it's a, something about a small rural school, the heart of the heart of an American tradition that's that's dying. And with the death of the American school, I took a whole bunch of notes on this often dies infrastructure, social services, the community center dies with it. Property values plunge. And so I don't, you guys are doing a really, really hard job. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'm not really testifying or speaking before you all, but I want to speak to the city of the city of Montpelier and the people in Montpelier and just say, um, we are, we have a wonderful thriving community. I could, if I had time, I could tell you all the, the um, nonprofits that are working in town and working with Vermont council and rural development, hopefully for community visits project, working with USDA rural um, ag aid um, to get low income folk access to things like furnaces um, Roxbury Roots, we're working with um, um, uh, making food for the food shelf and community dinners. There's a Roxbury Crafters group that we, we live in a tremendously vital community that will be devastated economically, emotionally, aspirations will be leveled <clears throat> if the school closes. So I'm pleading, maybe not to you, I've seen the writing, you know, I'm not a I'm not a utopian. I don't have a utopian fantasy. I saw the writing on the wall, but I just want to say maybe to the residents of Roxbury of, of Montpelier, um, please, please help us keep this school open for one more year. We need more time. There has not been enough time. The language has been dreadful. Uh, piece of people in Montpelier describing uh, Roxbury village school as a somehow subsidized as if we, we don't pay taxes. Um, and I just wanna say, and as you mentioned, Jake, about the terrible irony of here, Act 127, which was supposed to address equity. And this is a, this is a, this, a school that needs, certainly a lot of health and services is, is being really hurt by it. So I'm kind of appealing to the, the voters of Montpelier to say, hey, you know, if you believe in a progressive vision for rural development and growth and sustainability, please find a compromise in this budget, um, at least for this next year. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, Morgan Lloyd, UES teacher, parent um, and taxpayer in Montpelier. Um, am I right that the Roxbury community voted to pass the budget. I just want to start by thanking the voters in Roxbury for um, supporting their schools and their school budget. Um, sorry. I also, I really just want to urge, we've talked about it here and the, the message to the voters of so many school budgets being voted down. I really want to urge everyone here to take action. All of the thoughts that we have about the problem lying with the legislature and with the funding at the state level are are very supported here in this room, but unless we take action to make our voices heard and contact our legislators and contact the governor who won't be listening anyway, but I, I really just wanna urge everyone listening online and everyone in the room to take some action today to urge our legislators to fix funding for school education or for schooling in Vermont. Um, 
I also want to urge the board not to make a decision to close Roxbury Village on short notice. The last time that you met, you made a decision to form a committee to investigate. I really believe that this irreversible decision deserves um, deserves a process and a timeline that's respectful of the students in that school and of the uh, staff in the community who has supported that school and now ours as well. Um, I share Joe's concern about rifts, and I think that's unavoidable at this point, but I believe that that uncertainty um, will not only make showing up for work difficult, but I really believe that we will lose high quality staff because when everyone gets a RIF notice, you start to feel like your position is not so certain. There's probably some good communication um, for our administrators to do around that to try to reduce the impact of this budget situation. Finally, I just want to end by asking, you know, in that slides that Libby shared, there are so many things. I don't know what the dollar amount is that we could save, but there are so many creative ways to save money that I'm not seeing in these slides. And so I want the board to ask questions about things like increasing class size at the elementary level. That's what I know best. Multi-age classrooms. Um, what When I started in the Montpelier Roxbury schools, Montpelier public schools, um, UES was a K-5 school with declining enrollment do we have space to make UES K-5 again and hold 6 through 12 at Montpelier High School? Could we look at closing the middle school as opposed to Roxbury Village School? Do we have the capacity to house our students in another way? What opportunities does our district have to generate income, whether that's through tuition uh, students or international students, renting spaces? These are questions that I would like the board to ask um, before we look at cutting positions, closing schools, and reducing services for kids in our community. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? I'll give it another shot. I'd like to thank you, by the way, for your comments, because I think there are, are a lot of things that could be explored before you take the drastic action to close a school. There's been, I don't know how many times I've heard it, that all oh, the Roxbury kids could get a just as good or a better education experience at UES than they can at RVS. Well, that's just not true. Um, I don't think the U UES kids take forest walks and have science in the forest or, um, you know, go ice skating on their own ice skating pond. You know, I don't think they do those things. And But Roxbury kids do. You know, we have a new park right across the street from the school where they'll be able to have classes in, in, the, in the gazebo or, or doing things, that, you know, that you don't have access to here. So we have a, an excellent program in Roxbury. And you're not going to save. I've said this 100 times. You're not going to save the money you think you're going to save. Because at least $500,000 of what you attribute to Roxbury is not going to go away. That money is going to just be reabsorbed, and you're still going to pay it. It's Libby's salary. It's her staff salary. Her, her salary for, for Roxbury, not her salary, but her staff is... Uh, Oh, what is it? Four hundred and forty-five thousand dollars for the little three-room school of Roxbury. Four hundred and forty-five thousand dollars for your office. In addition to that, is operation and maintenance services. That's for mowing the lawn, I guess, and you know, cleaning the building. Seventy-seven thousand dollars. You're going to get rid of those guys? No, they're going to come back and go to work here. The the guy that mows the lawn comes out from Montpelier. Mows the lawn comes back. He's not going to go away. Those costs are going to be ongoing. You're not going to save 1.5 million like people in Montpelier want to throw around. It just isn't going to happen. In addition to that, you know, if you close UES, nobody would even know it. It's on a back street. Nobody even looks at it, you know? Unless you live next door, you could fall down. You wouldn't even, you know, nobody in, in Montpelier would care really. Certainly I wouldn't if I was driving through town. You would never see it. But in Roxbury, what are we going to do with that building? It was built as a school building. It was paid for. When we joined with you guys, we took on a portion of your debt. And we've been paying a portion of that debt for the last 
five, eight years, however it's been, are we going to get any money back? Are you going to buy us out of this contract? Or are you just going to, oh, well, we'll give you the building back for a dollar. You know, it's just not going to work. You need to give us time to work out what we can do and how we can maintain that building because the cost of the cost of educating a kid in Roxbury, according to Libby's slide 20, which Jim says is meaningless. You did say that the other night, Monday, you said these numbers are meaningless. It says but this number for Roxbury is $5,000 more per kid than UES. Now that's probably just busing, you know? What's $5,000 per kid? And, you know, and, and our, our numbers are going up. Your numbers are going down, you know? So you need to think long and hard about what you're actually saying. And, and people in Montpelier need to think long and hard about what they say and how derogatory they are towards the town of Roxbury. You know, we got forced into this merger. We didn't have a choice. We thought we were getting a good deal, but the, I can guarantee you the townspeople who voted on it never knew that we were gonna get, that you, that the decision to close it was gonna be made by this board. Nobody in town knew that, except for those people who were negotiating. It was not widely known. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have three people on, two people online. Um, Tim and Melissa. Tim? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you all. This is a really important meeting and very long. Um, but I appreciate it. Uh, this is Tim Sinnett, the father of two boys in UES and MSMS, and a Montpelier resident. Um, if we're setting the record straight, as John Guifrey wanted to do earlier this evening, I would like to point out that the closure of Roxbury Village School was certainly discussed during the merger committee work, uh, meaning, that, meaning that closing RVS was not at all off the table. I have a much larger and longer comment that I'll be emailing you all, plus John and Libby, um, but I just wanted to point to one quote from the minutes of a February 6, 2017, uh, Roxbury Montpelier School Consolidation Study Committee, of which John Guifrey was chairperson. Uh, in those minutes, it says, Chairperson Guifrey said that he is not interested in seeing RVS closed and that the distance from Montpelier would help keep the, the building open because no one wants to bus young children large distances, whereas if Roxbury merged with Northfield, it might be considered acceptable to bus young children to Northfield. I was going to read that again, but I think I'll just let that sink in for a second. Um, so Chairperson Guifrey himself discussed the possibility of a Roxbury Village school closure. And I would argue that his calculation in that comment was both risky and more importantly, manipulative. Thank you all for your time tonight and much appreciation for the week ahead. Thank you, Chair. Although I would, I would like to remind the public to please keep comments as impersonal as possible and, and based on the facts. Uh, uh, but it, no, I, I, no, I appreciate that. I just, I just, well, I'm just, i not sure. I'm not sure it's helpful to, to say things like, I think it's great to point out that comment and that it was okay. discussed. I, let, me, uh, let me just say one last thing, which is I think that John should yeah. apologize to Tina Muncy. Thank you. Yeah, no, John did the same thing, and I think the reminder should go out to John. I and I, I know it's 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 there are other community members who've who've said things. Th this is hard. I mm -hmm. think we should trust that the intentions of everyone are 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 good and above board. Uh, no, sorry to call you out, Tim. It's just I I don't. No, that's fine. Yeah. No, I. I, I the comment. Thank you. I, no, I think it's good to point out that that it was discussed and John probably knew it at the time, whether he was being manipulative or not, I think is, is something that, that hopefully, and I, I think this for everyone, I, I think if we can avoid those characterizations, I think we all have a, a better discussion. Because um, there's a, a lot of misinformation out there. It's not, it's not, um, Melissa. Yeah, no, and, and thank you, Tim. And I didn't mean to call you out. I, I apologize for that, but I just wanted to 
use that opportunity to point out that if we can, um, for everyone, if, if we can keep keep it from being personal, I think we'll all be better off. Uh, Melissa. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right, thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments that I heard from Kristen as well as some others uh, tonight. I think the busing situation, as it was somewhat brushed off of the logistics and put onto the bus company, I think uh, needs to be at the forefront. Um, I do not agree with kids, kindergartners getting on the bus at 6.30 in the morning. I also recognize I'm an AOT person. 32 miles of our town is back roads. 10 miles of our road is pavement. That bus never leaves pavement. Let that sink in. 32 miles of people drive their kids to meet that bus multiple miles. Very few kids get to walk home. And most of our kids don't use the bus because their parents already have to put them in the car to drive them to the bus stop. So why not leave a little later and just drive them to school? So those same students will not be able to be dropped off at their houses at the end of the normal school day. They will. Their parents would have to meet them at the end of the road because over 50% of our bus stops are road intersections. They are not houses. I know this is the case, obviously, in Montpelier, but I watch, I follow one of those buses every day when I pick up from Main Street, and those students walk through two or three houses down to their house. That is not the case with Roxbury students. That is why we have a robust after-school program, because those kids cannot go home. And given the competitive nature of part two and other options in Montpelier for after school care. It is my opinion, you cannot absorb those kids into those programs with the timeline we are giving. And those students then will have nowhere to go after school because we rely very heavily on the after school program in Roxbury. It's hard enough with middle school and high school students who also cannot walk home because they're walking seven or eight miles, some of them, that is just ridiculous. And we already have to find options for those students to be picked up by other individuals or try to find activities after school that align with the bus that is provided. You're now going to double that logistical nightmare for families when you add elementary school students into that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have one more, uh, Jacqueline. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. I'm looking at a, a, a Zoom. It's fine. Hi, everyone. Jacqueline Frazier. I am also a Roxbury School graduate. I went to U32 High School, and I have been um, abroad for the last 10 years, and I moved back to Roxbury. I was not expecting to have my children be in the local school here, but I've been incredibly thrilled with the results of them having attended the school. I have a seven-year-old and a uh, fourth grader who will be heading uh, into Montpelier next year. I'm I'm exhausted. I don't know how else to say it other than I am just exhausted with the back and forth, just like I'm sure all of you are. I'm a single parent. I want to know what's happening next year. So I make decisions that will allow me to take care of my children because as Melissa just said, I don't know what to do with them after school if I'm if I have to be responsible for them, knowing we had already gotten a grant for after school programs next year, knowing that I have to be there for my seven year old kid who, by the way, good luck to the bus driver who's going to have him on her bus her bus for an hour and a half. I wish her the best of luck on that. I do wonder what the plan is for other young children to be on that bus because they're going to need a lot of support. Um, so I, I'm just, you know, I want this to be wrapped up in as efficient a manner as it can be so that we can try to make the plans necessary to, to deal with this major upheaval in our lives. And as a graduate of Roxbury, of course, I mean, I can speak to all of my colleagues in Roxbury School who've gone on to do amazing things. We all came from a very tiny school, but it was that um, niche and that really special, unique uh, element of having it been such a small school that allowed us to spread, spread our wings so broadly. So th thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I think that was the final uh public comment thank you thank you everyone um so in terms of our next steps my suggestion i'm happy to um have it amended 
is that we give Livy some parameters of I think a slightly more formal budget presentation. Um, I think we probably want multiple options. My initial option is that you build on the three that you presented tonight and go into a little more depth and kind of put it kind of in a little you know, form that you put the original budget presentations in so we can really see it. Um, and I know that you have Christina back, uh, which I think will be helpful because I know she's just wrapping up her vacation. So that would be my suggestion. I don't know if people have other suggestions or, or more specific things you want to see. I mean, I think one, one question that might be good for me to see is that came up is um, your confidence level of of a transition if we do send you kids to us i mean things like part two will there will there be space okay um like having some answers to you know the house on that um i don't know if i'd have be able to do that in a week yeah i mean like some of the like would we have space for yeah you know, like the transportation question can we get them there mm -hmm. can we can we house them after school and not all the particulars but are there any big obstacles that you see? Yeah. Scott has hand up and- And Scott. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, uh, Libby, I know you had like less than 24 hours to put that presentation together and I really appreciate. Um, for the next one, um, if you could be consistent in the scenarios, the way that you describe. So I think if I remember correctly, in the first scenario, you had things like FTEs, and then the second one, you had it broken down by spending category. Um, and so it's hard to compare sort of apples to apples that way. Um, so as best as you can be consistent across the options would be my um, request. Um, and I also, again, know that you're, you know, working more than overtime on this. So I appreciate it. Um, I was just saying and thinking as you were asking for those other details that to me feels like the work we would be asking the committee to do to look into transportation after school options. So I'm not sure we'd want to include those in the budget conversation. I, th I think I mean, the reason I have it is because if if we do opt to send UAS students starting in fall, I, I think Libby knows enough to know that like Hey, there's no way we can get that. Or like, yeah, we, you know, as, as you know, it's kind of the answer to Chris, Kristen's earlier question. Yes, we have an existing bus. We have room on a bus. I mean, like the the, the part two question, like if there's a if there's going to be an after school care problem, do we know that immediately? I mean, I think the committee knows that. I'm not sure we can get the committee to answer those questions if we have to pass a budget in three weeks. I mean, and if there's a major hurdle. I would say that if, if I knew of a major hurdle right now, I wouldn't be presenting it as an option to the board. Okay. Yeah. I guess I'm just thinking, Jim, I, we have heard from people who have deep concerns about the tax implications of a budget that was the size that we proposed and even maybe a little yeah. bit smaller. We've also heard from people who have deep concerns about the life implications of making a decision that is irreversible to close a school within one month's time. And I think that one of the things that has gotten challenging about these conversations is that we start to go down different tangents, like, should we put kindergartners on a bus when what we're really trying to do is figure out what the budget looks like? And I understand that those are interrelated, yeah. but we have also heard from members of both communities telling us, take your time on a big decision like that. And so I think it's more valuable for us as a board to look at the budget scenarios regarding the numbers that they represent and not the details of like, what would it take to make it work if we were to close Roxbury Village School? So I would rather that we... But I think it's important that we have some knowledge about what those numbers mean. And, and yeah. I mean, we can't make them in a vacuum. We, we can't, I mean, we could just say, let me find 1.5 million that you want and we'll pass it. Except because, that Libby just told us if she, if she saw a major hurdle to it, yes. she wouldn't have put it forward. Yes. And Which is good information to have. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And so I think it's more our role to look at the numbers in the big picture. And as Libby said, at the beginning of the yes. budget conversation, decide as a board, 
what we think a renewed budget going back to our voters and another effort could pass. And maybe there are board members who think a budget that looks more like $700,000 cuts really would pass. Maybe there are board members who say, no way, I think we got to go to 1.5 million. Maybe there are board members here, we haven't discussed it, and we're not going to tonight, who say, actually, it should probably be 2.2 million. <laughs> that third scenario is looking yeah. pretty good to me because I'm really concerned about tax increases. And I don't think it's worth us to get into the details of how would it work. I think that is putting the cart before the horse. And I, oh, I'm not, okay, I'm not sorry. finished. And I think that there it's just my two cents as far as whether or not it makes sense to have that big decision happen within a month is that it would be really valuable to go through a full process, which we have already begun and have that con have and ask the committee to dive into those questions and not do it at the board level because this is what we have established. And when, when we look back on big decisions that we have had to make as a board, I've only been here three and a half years, but we've had some pretty big ones. The times that we have taken our time, like with school safety and really run a process, we have been able to make, to do the due diligence that it takes to make the best decision for our community. And when we haven't run a real process, we find ourselves with the decisions not fully embraced by the community. And this is a decision that has way higher stakes than any of the other ones that we have considered before. And it feels valuable for both of our communities to, to do that due diligence. And I don't think having the conversation about whether or not we can put kindergartners on a bus next week is the right time to have that conversation. So I, I think we just need to be looking at budget scenarios. But how can we look at budget scenarios without knowing the implications of those budget scenarios? Because all of the things she put have different implications. They're all, all these decisions are going to be rushed. You know, the slide five that wasn't closing Roxbury, that's going to have implications. And it's going to have a different set of implications. And those implications, we're going to have to live with them. Closing Roxbury is going to have implications. It's, it's going to have a different set of implications in slide five. And we're going to have to live with them. We have to make a rush decision either way. And we have to have some education on what the implications of those various decisions are. It's not just about a number. There is, There are impacts behind those numbers and how we cut and where we cut and the choices we make are going to have lasting. All of these, all of these decisions are potentially irreversible. So I think we have to have some awareness of where the potholes are with all of these. And, and that's why- well, I do want to point out that the thing you were asking about as far as awareness goes only pertained to closing Roxbury Village School. Just now, when you were saying, can you give us some scenarios of what it would look like to transition? That's what I mean by, when, by putting the cart before the horse. Yes, <clears throat> but we got some questions about that and, and some legitimate questions. Like, you know, like after school care is a big deal. I, you know, I would love to hear more about the implications of getting rid of the MSMS bus as well. well we've got Scott and yeah. Tim with their hands up. So, um, yeah. yeah, time is time. It's late. Um, and I know we talked about circling back to the committee. And then, Mia, you just brought it up, and, and Morgan brought it up before. I think, I think we need to make some decisions about the committee and let the committee do its work. Um, I know our time is short. Um, I, I don't know if it's possible. I, I heard Joe's um, uh, comment and just the idea of RIF notices going out to all of the teachers is just, just destroys me to my core. Can we not like perhaps work with the union to reopen that clause of the contract such that we can not send RIF notices until maybe the end of April or, you know, like, we're talking about trying to be flexible and the importance of, of the process. And yet I think it's just, it, it's a little disingenuous to be into entering into the conversation about closing uh, the Roxbury village school after we just developed a process through which we all agreed we would go through before making a decision. Um, so, so I, I do think we need to act on the committee as quickly as possible 
and do whatever we can to hold off on um, on making a decision until we have the information that we need. And again, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know what the implications are, to, or even if it's possible to reopen the, the, the contract, but but have those conversations and, and then decide. At this point, we already know that we're going to have we're, we're past the, the March 30th de uh, deadline. So so maybe we can hold off on sending RIF notices to all our teachers um, and, and give us some time to get into the end of April, perhaps, and let the committee meet for a month and go through the process a, a, and get the community input that we, we said we all wanted. Yep. Yeah, with... Um... Libby, I do appreciate the um, budget scenarios you put forward, but I think one of the in, inadvertent sort of ways that that got teed up was it sort of, you know, you had the cut Montpelier slide and then you had the cut Roxbury slide. And it kind of, I think, teed up a bit of a combativeness between the two ideas. And I think, I wonder if we can have more of an a la carte options list kind of in the vein that Scott suggested with um, numbers that were consistent across. So we had a framing of, you know, FTEs or this, that, whatever you can find, but in a way that was, we could understand it as compared to other options and just see a list of areas and sort of what the impact of that would be in a bullet or two. Um, Right now, seeing it as a package, sort of package one versus package two, doesn't doesn't quite feel right to me. And I think um, while I understand that to realize the savings for you know if you're if you're trying to grab one point five million dollars at once, there's a scenario where a lot of these have to come together. I I get that. Um, I think I'd rather look at a list that was. Um, that we could understand and maybe have then have the discussion amongst the board to say, okay, well, we think that this might be an area, this might be an area. We, we might end up in the place where it's, you know, there is, there is will to grab the $1.5 million chunk. But I, 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 I really don't feel like, and I recognize, you know, me has been here for three and a half years. I've been here about three and a half hours. So I don't have a lot of the background to understand and it may be obvious to everyone here, but I, I can't, based on what I've seen tonight, make reasonable decisions. And so I wonder um, if a more a la carte presentation would be helpful. And if you have a timeline where we have specific questions, um, what would that be so that we can kind of feel ready for the next conversation? Uh can't do that. Uh, the challenge is that to get to numbers that I believe we need to get to to pass a budget, you're talking about a significant number of FTE. So what you would see is 15 FTE from MREA. MRE. I can't. I can't do that from. Well, you did that at three in your slide one. Yeah, so it would be a bigger number, right? So then, where would those? The next logical question that I know these school board members will ask me is where's where do they come from? Right, what position I, are you referring to? I guess I would I would ask that sort of we have the chance to do the math on that and say if we can just figure out, well, what is your sort of you know FTE cost? And then what's you know, how many do you think like it's I I'm not advocating that this is sort of an FTE based approach in any way, shape, or form. I just want to see a list because right now I just see a couple of sort of all or nothing scenarios that I'm not sure. I guess I want to think a bit more whether there's different options in between those. The Roxbury decision, it, it doesn't feel like it can be broken down into a la carte pieces. It feels like a single Absolutely. concept, right? And slide three seems a little like Roxbury plus <clears throat> some variation. Again, because it could be like slide three could could be Roxbury. Roxbury's a chunk. Yeah, no, I get yeah. that. I totally get that certain decisions might have to be yeah. carried and, and if we see we... consequences. Yeah. But right now, for example, you know, presumably there might be something small 
at Roxbury that can be cut um, in the same way that there are some at Montpelier that can be cut. I just want to see that out because right now, unless what the message is, is that we really only have choice A or choice B and we can't consider putting your package together. I, just yeah. two quick things. I think it's really important for us all to remember in this conversation that there are Roxbury students at MSMS and MHS as well. And they would also be negatively impacted by any cuts to staff. Um, and then two, um, I think if there was some hidden mattress with money in it, we would have found it by now. I, you know, we just, we spent so much time and I just, I have so much respect for Libby and her leadership team, which very clearly has spent so much time on this. So like, I don't think we're going to find another answer. I think we've been told that we have to make something a pretty serious decision in a pretty short period of time because we answer to the taxpayers. And I don't, I don't know if slicing this differently or showing, and I, I agree, it would be great to have like more of that in, but there's only 24 hours in the day. But I mean, that's just the reality is we have to find a way to get a budget that will actually pass in Montpelier. And I don't know how many different ways we can slice it because we are still one district. We are not Montpelier Roxbury. We are Montpelier Roxbury. And the students are all together at MSMS and MHS. And those teaching cuts would directly impact students in both towns in all four buildings. So it's not an either or. Either way, we're going to have to make a really hard decision that's going to hurt our entire district. And but we don't have a choice between how the funding works and what the voters are able and willing to pay. We're gonna. I just think we're. I don't think there's some hidden way around this. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Thanks. Right. I'm curious what the situation where if there is in fact a grant funded after school program at RBS, if there's a combination of RBS students, what that might look at like with RBS students at UES and then doing the after school program at RBS. Because a lot of what we're losing is community and that, and that vitality. And I'm not saying that that's gonna be a choice that the board would make, but I'm really, I personally would, would really like to see what that might look like um, as an option because um, that would, that might, it, it, it's, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as cost saving, I understand, but if there's a big grant that's kind of already in the works, I don't, you know, for the after school program, there's no known use for the building other than our kids. Um, I would really like to see that as a temporary a possibility. Put in for the after school grant, we have not heard. But I think it was due today, so we haven't heard whether, or maybe Friday, we haven't heard whether we got it or not. But we did put in for it. I mean, it would be money that we would be, I don't know what, you know, like if we did get it, then it's already there. So as a scenario, I'm curious what that might look like. I would be interested in that as an ongoing cost. Because I act two is ninety dollars a week, and I part two, part two, yeah, and I that's more than a twenty percent increase in in my income. It's uh, also a subsidized program, so yeah, well, that's not going to help. Yeah. Scott, yeah, just another you know, thought about creativity. Um, you know, I know before COVID, there was lengthy conversations around um, like a language immersion program. I know a lot of Montpelier residents that would gladly put their kids on a bus for 45 minutes to Roxbury to be able to be in a language immersion program. And I, I, I remember the conversation distinctly about not talking about closing Roxbury Village School, but about educating our, our Roxbury residents, the K through four Roxbury residents at UES. And so, and so, yeah, I, I just, I, 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 those are the kinds of things that I think the committee could, could get into. And again, why I think it's so important to have those conversations and, and not just rush the decision at the board level. Um, yeah. So again, like we, we've talked about different ways to be creative. Um, and, and I, and I want to want to see those, um, those scenarios play out. So that we're not just closing a school, but perhaps reinvigorating the community. 
I don't want to, I don't want this comment to sound like I'm against Roxbury Village School in any way, shape or form. It's one of my four babies. So I don't want anybody to take it as that. Um, however, this board is in a position where you need to cut costs. Like we need to get the tax rate down. And so that is, that quite honestly, to sound heartless a little bit is your main task right now. Yeah. Is yes. that we have to get the tax rate down and that means we have to cut costs. Um, it's getting late, so I risk saying something stupid. Um, but, you know, I, I originally was for the deliberate approach of forming the committee and taking a year. Um, but what happened between then and now is our budget was defeated. Um, so it's a, it's a different landscape. And as you said, we do have to cut costs. Um, and what's occurring to me is that this feels ultra rushed and it's pretty awful. Um, but what would be even worse is if Roxbury, Rox, Roxbury Village School starts up in August and there aren't enough staff, and at that point, it has to the decision has to be made. That would be a hundred times worse than this, and that's my fear. Um, so that is where I am at. The longer you guys differ around, you know that's a possibility. So um, I was going to propose. I do realize that it's late. I think we have identified that the committee would be useless, useful. <laughs> See, it's late. I'm saying something <laughs> stupid. Useful no matter what. Yes. And so I think it would be worthwhile to name, to nominate the, or vo I forget exactly, to the committees, do we nominate? Maybe, I'll just yeah. use it. The, to nominate the people on this board who will serve on the R Roxbury Village School Future Committee, whatever you're deciding to call it, and we can get started on staffing that up with the community members as well by putting the notices out. If you know, if you're interested, send us the letters of interest, and the board can decide by the March 20th meeting who's going to be on that committee. And at that point, if there is some sort of decision that is somewhat final for Roxbury Village School, which I truly hope there is not by March 20th. Um, then the committee can have a different task ahead of it than we originally intended. But it is my hope that that committee will follow through on the deliberate process that we set forth. And I would like to get, either way, I would like to get that committee going sooner rather than later. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that the, the committee has purpose regardless, whether it's, whether it's a, a how or, or what. And I don't think we have to take too long tonight to put the board members on yeah. the committee. Because yeah. They, yeah, we can do that. We can do that. I, first of all, let's see if Libby has some clarity. So I think what we want is kind of a, a version of what you put together tonight. Um, I need to know what, how much you want to, I need to know what I'm going for. Like a dollar figure or like a tax rate increase tax rate, that yeah. the board would be comfortable for me to get around. Now the tax rate could change because as my friend Jake will tell us that dollar yield's not set. Yeah. So like a range of what you think the voters will vote up yes on is really what we need. Just for, so the Roxbury voters did vote yes. So I, I also, so I'm kind of looking to our, our Montpelier folks and right. you are more yeah. attuned to your community members and what they are asking of us. So I would ask you all, where do you think Montpelier folks want to land? I, I, there's no crystal ball, but even if it's a range. Yeah, I think it's really hard to say. Yeah. I think it's hard to say. Because without the range, I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I can present something to you and it's going to work for some of you and it's not going to work for other people and it's not going to be enough or it's going to be too much or so I need, I need something to go on here. Um, you know, with regards to the yield, um, it's going to go up. I don't know how much, but, um, you know, I have a common yield here that the two of us do every morning together. Um, uh, you know, so many budgets were defeated around the state. And as those are revised, that actually increases the yield for everybody. Um, so, you know, I'm, I guess I'm asking like, 
could we just assume a higher yield and plug it in? Well, you and I were talking about that, and I'm kind of going with that 10,000 number. Yeah, let's use that. Yeah. Is that realistic? Yeah. Yeah. We're close to it. Is it low? <laughs> Is it what? Jim's like, could it be higher? Could it be 11? Maybe 12? Um, if, <laughs> if they put a new revenue source into the Ed Fund, it would go higher, but yeah. that's sounding maybe not so likely. So, so 10 sounds conservative. Realistic. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, yeah. Um, I can use, that's what Jake and I have already okay. talked about is, is assuming it's going to be around $10,000. Okay. And that helps. It does. I mean, I think if we could bring the rate into the mid to low teens, that would be, I think that would show a really solid effort to, it would still be much higher than we've seen in past years, but I think that would show a really solid effort to bring it down to 24. Yes, like Is that 10 or less? Huh? I was thinking 10 or less. So I think mid teens, I don't know. It's yeah. still low lot. teens. I mean, 10 or less is getting. Yeah, I know. That's a lot. That's how much? About 25. It's the third scenario. Yeah. It could be very low teens. <laughs> like 11. So, Libby, really quickly, what was the, the second scenario? The second scenario was a cut of $1.5 million. Yeah. And, and what was the, the tax, projected the tax? Tax implication was about 12 yeah. percent yeah. increase. Sorry. Yes. Um, the second, the second slide was 1.975 million. Oh, that's right. And it was a tax increase in Montpelier with a $9,775 yield at 11.69%. Thank you. We were, we were, it was supposed to be 24% like a couple of weeks like, ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what ultimately lets the voters. Yep. With a, with a lower yield. Are we still in a place where $500,000 is a somewhat somewhat equivalent to three cents in Montpelier? Should be. So it's still around that. So a $1 million cut without Roxbury in it, million dollars with, you know, one point whatever it is, you know, this, I don't know that this slide number six can just go away, but maybe there's a, a high number with this as an option. And I don't know, is there a way to find a million dollars just as an option, not as a, just to, to put it out there so that we can. So why don't we just do around the room what people sense are of where we need to get modular tax rates? Because Roxbury actually starts to go into negative with some of the the bigger cuts. So it sounds, Kristen, well, well since I mean, and I'm not going to say, you know, an 11% tax increase for Roxbury is very real for some folks. So, I mean, I'm not saying some Roxbury folks could also appreciate, you know, a decrease. Yeah. Um, you know, it did pass. It passed by 34 votes. So it's not like, you know, 55% of the voters voted yes, 45% voted no. So it was not a landslide, right? So, um, um, <clears throat> so I mean, as, as far as Roxbury goes, you know, an additional decrease of one to 2%, I mean, as, as, uh, you know, take a look at, but you know, it did pass. So, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things motivating Roxbury for that budget to pass. Yes. Well, and I also want to point out that if we do send RVS students to UES, even though the tax implications of Roxbury may go down, the no votes may go up. What's that? What I said, even though the the tax implications in Roxbury may go down, there's a chance that the no votes may go up. Rhett, what's your sense? Uh, I think the sweet spot is I, I would like to see a scenario without RVS students going to UES. I would like to see a scenario where the building is utilized for after school. And I would like to see a third scenario that cuts a million dollars. 
just a river? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, because can you get to 1.5 without RBS? I don't Wait, know. I'm sorry. Are we talking about substantive ideas for reducing or no, are we talking about, about kind of like numbers? A palatable, a palatable tax increase that, okay. that, that voters are like. Okay. Like what's, what's the number that, that voters? 1.4 gets Montpelier down to 11.69. 1.4 cut in spending plus That's $575. Plus. Yeah. plus. $1,000. Yeah. All right. So it's Revenue like $2 million. That's $2 million gets you down to 11.69. Yeah. I don't know if I can say anything that makes any sense at this point. I'm sorry. It's okay. You know, given that if we were at 24%, if, we, if it was now, if we could make it 12%-ish, that would be meaningful. Um, and, you know, the, the conversations that I was having leading up to the vote and the emails that we were getting and the, the, the posts that I was reading on Front Porch Forum, I did not see very many numbers mentioned. What I saw were principles. And there were a lot of people who made the case that voting no um, would mean that we would have to revisit the, the, the conversation of merger with U32 or, or closing Roxbury. And so I get the impression from, from all of those bits of information that it's, it's not necessarily the, the percent figure so much as the decisions that we make. And so if we decide to, not saying that I'm supporting this, but if we decide to educate the K4 Roxbury students at UES, and that only results in a 16% or that results in a 16% um, tax increase. I, I think we'll get a lot of people that will support that budget because we closed the, we decided to close the school. Now, I'm again, not suggesting that we should do that, but I, I, I guess that's evidence for me that it's not so much the, the percent value so much as it's, it's what those specific um, decisions that we make um, represent. So I don't know that that helped at all, um, but, but, but I, I think it's a very I, apt observation. Yeah, which is why I think us throwing out percentages tonight is just a guess. I think it's just a guess, Joe. Yeah. I think it. <laughs> I know that's what you're asking for, Libby. I'm sorry. Yeah, because the reality is we have to get a printer to print what we're asking for in three weeks. So it's not ideal, but I think we. That's what happened when our budget got voted down. Now this is how we have to do it. I mean, I think the important thing is that we we show that we are making hard choices and being responsible to the very real financial concerns of this community. Um, and I think Scott's <laughs> point is very really apt that I think that's what I heard is it's, yeah. You know, it's time to, to make some some tough choices and, and to acknowledge that we're not playing with monopoly money. If you want a number, I think I think if we can get in the ten to twelve percent range, I think that's pretty safe. And I think that I, th I don't think we can do that without making the type of choices that people are asking us to make. Would you say you went already? I, don't know. I did. Okay. <laughs> um, I, so what got voted down yesterday was like 23, 24%. So um, I'm sort of with Jake in the 12%, 12 to 14. I think it would show a, a very real response to that. And it's a very real amount of money. Um, but I'm really concerned by going below 10 or to eight, because looking at what 8% in, still increase gets us is a really, um, really ripped apart district. And I, I don't, I don't want this situation to make us do something so drastic because once we do something, we can't undo it. So if we're losing educators and we're closing buildings and everything like that, um, and it still leads to a tax increase, um, then that feels futile. So I feel like 10 to 12 to 14 at the most would probably be palatable. You said ten or less. Um, yeah, I'm I'm closer to the ten. Um, 
and possibly because I'm the oldest person on the board and probably the only person on the board who's on a fixed income. And so I hear from people like that. And, um, you know, it's a reality in Montpelier. It, Montpelier is becoming a very unaffordable place to live for many people. And the school tax is a huge part of that. So um, I think, and, and, you know, that compounds every year. It's not like we're going to increase, decrease our budget a whole lot next year. It's going to be added on to what we already add on this year. And so every year it just becomes this heavier and heavier burden for people. So I think we really have to think about that. And Montpelier has a pretty high population of people who are over 65. Yeah, I think I really agree with what Scott said. Um, I think it's more sort of what what we're seen as doing than, than a certain number. I want to be really cautious about overreacting to this. If if you know this board thought um, that the budget passed, uh, that the budget recommended was responsible, I want to make sure that we're not overreacting and, and taking too much from this vote in a way that's going to make irreparable change. Um, so, you know, while I certainly want to be low 20, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't think that's ultimately the message that is going to get through. I think we, you know, so one thing I've been thinking with, um, discussion about where to educate kids from Rapsbury is, is, um, it seems like there's not been direction on that question. And all of a sudden we're going from not really engaging with that question to, you know, thinking about answering it within a couple of weeks. And that, that's a little concerning to me, the speed there. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned about that pace. Um, and I heard, I watched the, the discussion about establishing the committee that I, I don't think that sort of endless discussion about, you know, what to do on the matter is appropriate either, but I, I think that I'm really uncomfortable with making a decision of that consequence in this short period of time. And I wonder if there's some ability to signal, we heard from a few people that, you know, even the year is really important and I want to think on that more about whether or not there's a way to signal a direction, maybe focusing more on the how as opposed to the weather and um, really understanding what the, um, what our position is with our existing fund balance, how that can be utilized. Cause I do see the potential for a bridge. If there is a substantial cost saving and there's a direction clearly articulated by this board where that could be utilized in the short term. And, you know, if there is general consensus that a change might be in order, um, there may be savings in the subsequent year so as not to create any kind of shock. I think I'd like to explore that issue a little bit more, but I don't have like a, a specific number. Give a shot. Give a shot. See what I can bring to you. I, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing in the fuzziness something around 12. Yeah, that's what I wrote down. Um, with the, the what's matter. Um, I think we can name two members of the, to the committee now. Um, We're, we're, we're all slightly zombie-like uh, or heading in that direction. Um, I'll just open it up for discussion. I, I think we... Did, did did we, say we two or four? I think we said two four. Two for Roxbury, two, two for Montpelier. Yeah. So, so that's, we're done. Brett and <laughs> Chris are already... All wrapped up. We're, we're done on the Roxbury side. That, that's, that's easy. Uh, assuming you guys want to. We, we're not going to force in? you. Yeah. <clears throat> Pumped. Um, <laughs> Uh, who from the, I 
I was on the merger committee, I would happy be happy to, to step up again. Um, I mean, I, I, I want to do it the acknowledgement that I have put some language out there that we need to think seriously in this budget cycle about whether or not we send students to UES and perhaps before the committee has a chance to decide that. So um, I, I, if, if that makes me seem prejudiced, I, I just want that out there. I, I, um, I know others have, have maybe not stated, um, but I would be willing. Scott. I think I've probably shared privately with about half the folks um, on the board that I'd be more than happy to um, represent Montpelier. And Lynn, did I hear you say you're interested? Yeah, I'd be interested. Um, and, you know, I I do empathize with the situation in Roxbury. I don't, I don't want it to be um, a shock. And I also realize that we have to figure this out. <laughs> and so I would like it to be um, a, an honest process, right, that kind of values everybody involved. You know, and I am very much in that boat too. I mean, I, when I was part of the merger committee, I mean, I, I was really, I've, I've always been impressed with that school and impressed with that town. And uh, I ideally would, would love to keep that school open. I think closing is, is the worst possible option we have, except perhaps for all the rest. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm very cognizant of that. So, I'm, I'm happy to have it be Scott and Lynn. I have it to be some combination of whoever, but it seems like one of the three of us and I will let the board make a decision on that. But we have our Roxbury folks chosen. Um, I'm, I'm happy to have it be Scott and Lynn or me and, me and Lynn or me and Scott. Or, okay, well, I'm just going to make a nomination. Yeah. Uh, I nominate Jim and Lynn. Um, I do appreciate, Scott, your willingness to step forward. I think there's the perspective of that you have the historical perspective, Jim, of having been worked on, having worked on the merger. Um, and, and Lynn, I think your perspective as, as you've said, maybe the only person on the board on a fixed income, um, do those two combinations, I think are, um, very helpful perspectives to have in the conversation. But I do appreciate you offering, Scott. Now that's my nomination, so, or my motion. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Any discussion or objections? I, I'm not sure that yeah, t Jim, I appreciate you, the historic perspective, but times are very different now, and the context is very different now. Um, and you've been pretty vocal um, over the last couple of weeks about your perspective. Um, and yeah, and so that that would be my concern. Um, so I want to voice it. And I think that's I think that's a valid concern. If if the rest of the board is is similarly concerned, I'm I'm happy to step aside. I am, I I mean I mean it when I say, you know, I I would like that school to survive. I am just being very realistic about what our budget situation is and what our choices are. I, and and I think my the the fact that I've I've been involved with that school for for four or five years is 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 part of of that perspective. I think um, from reading the post on Front Porch Forum, we do have some constituents who have that perspective of um, wanting to see things move along. Um, I think it's a quick turnaround myself, but I realize we're 
we're in a bad spot here and we really need to talk about it and figure it out. Yeah. So and, and I'm going to, I don't I, have a, and I think problem. some of the front porch forum perspectives and some others have been very unfair. I mean, you know, and wrong. And wrong. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, Roxbury is not subsidized by Montpelier. The, I don't think there's any objection there from a educational perspective to going to UAS. I think it's it's concerns about their community and the centerpiece of their community, um, and you know it's that's a that's a very important part of that town, um, and we have very hard choices to make. Jim, thank you for for bringing that up about Front Porch Forum, and and I I should have started by saying I also would feel comfortable with a combination of uh, Lynn and Scott, or Jim and Lynn, or Scott and Jim. I think those are the three possible combinations. So uh, I apologize for not for not starting with that comment. Yes. Um, uh, should should we move this to a vote, or do people want to amend or change it? I just think the last thing I'd like to add to the discussion part is that I think it's really important that anybody who joins the committee, I think it's impossible to have 0% bias coming into this. Yes. We all yeah. have an experience. And so I think we should just take that off the table as a possibility. But I think that there needs to be a commitment to anybody who is going to serve on this committee, whether it be a board member or a community member, that they are going to lead with curiosity and really good hard questions and not coming into this process with a foregone conclusion or decision. And so I just, I want to make, I want to get that out there. And it has been challenging at times, Jim, I will say that it sometimes does feel like there is a, um, an opinion that you hold about what is best for the Roxbury School. And I would say, if you're going to serve on this committee that you put that aside and that you be, and yes, the perspective is, is super meaningful and helpful and historical. I mean, it's yeah. very, that is very, very real. And I appreciate that. And I also want to make sure that whomever I am serving on this committee with is going to come to this work um, it, it, with a commitment to, to put the bias aside as much as humanly possible, knowing it can't completely go away. So I just want to add that. I just want to remind people too, we have this conversation at the last meeting, which is the committee does not decide, the board decides right. what happens. I mean, our job as I see it is to figure out the process for this happening in the, and do the least painless and most beneficial way to everybody, right? Well, it's, it's not, I just want to, the committee is not for the purpose of my understanding to make a recommendation is what we last discussed on the future of the Roxbury Village School. It's not a transition planning committee. It's a committee that's really the purpose is, is to deliberate the future of the building and where Roxbury elementary age students are best educated. So is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, should I move to vote? All those in favor of Mia's nomination or motion? motion. Yeah. Uh, aye. Aye. Sorry. Um, Mia's nomination was. My, I nominated Jim and Lynn to serve on the Roxbury Village School Committee. And, oh, all right. And are we doing a different vote for a different configuration? Nope. No. Just that. Just that configuration. Um, I can vote yes or no. Yes, you, you're allowed yeah, to. It's, it's your choice. You were sworn you in, so you, you can can't vote. Oh, yeah, you could abstain. Yes. Um, and there will be no other configuration that we're voting on. If it oh, goes. Oh, I think we have to formally nominate your point. We, <clears throat> if we, if we don't vote in favor of what my motion was, then we could try a different configuration. Okay. But it's also Kristen. I think we did that last meeting. So right now it's just Jim and Lynn serving as the Montpelier representatives on the Roxbury Village School Committee. I can say all those in favor. I did say I was. Oh, I don't. Did, I, got, said I. I said I. I got, I got, I got, I got three or four eyes. Jake, uh, Jake, Jake is, is wondering what his choices are. 
Uh, and I'm not sure Red or Kristen have spoken up yet, so they may be. Right. One, one, two, three, four. So yeah. we've got oh, okay. eight of 16 votes. Um, I think I think they count as one vote. We count as two. Oh, right. That's why you did eight. Got it. Got yeah. it. Thank you. So your vote would carry. So we need we need one more vote. And and I if, if if another configuration makes sense. Stare at him. I'm right next to him. I don't know if it's awkward. Uh, but um uh if you want to vote no, you can vote no. I good. Can I vote pass? You can vote pass. Pass. Abstain. I'll vote for. Yay. Okay. Wait. It's gotten sworn in. Have you gotten sworn in? Okay, you can't vote. <laughs> you can't vote. Scott, you can't vote. <laughs> but. I well, like the effort so, so much. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, do you want do you want me on the committee or not? I mean, I'm going to be honest. I think I can be a fair broker. I mean, I wanted to start this conversation four or five years ago because mm -hmm. I wanted to find a path to mm -hmm. save Roxbury. I, I've said what I said because I think we're at a really hard place. I'm going to be very honest. I mm -hmm. think of all the cuts out there, it has the least impact. And I think the path to save Roxbury for long term is very narrow. And I would hate to see us take a hatchet to things that are going to have a longer term impact. That's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I don't love the school. It's not because I don't love the community. Mm -hmm. It's because we're in a shitty spot. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of the choices we have, it does the least long term harm. And if we do send students to UES, I hope we, I think we can come together and do it in a way that is that that takes care of the hard problems and makes it as as wonderful as it can be. And I think it's a wonderful school. And I think the, the Roxbury students have the great experiences at MSMS and MHS. And I think they can have great experiences at UES too. And I think we can do as much as we can to heal the community. And, and I've just, it's been very difficult for me, but trying to steer through a, a Montpelier community that clearly has big concerns about what we're asking them to pay. It is one of the paths that I see as, as one of the most viable to, to getting to a yes vote and dealing with the crisis that Act 127. And that's, that's why I've been pushing us hard to seriously think about a very hard thing and making the case in a, in a way that might sound a little advocate-y, but I feel we need to grapple with this now. And I think if, if, we, if we do something different, we have to have a really good explanation to the voters why we're making the choices we're making. Because it's, it's, it's the, the, the case we made coming to the voters yesterday didn't sell. So really quickly, as the associate parliamentarian and the non-voting member, um, I think by my math, you've already, the, the, the motion passed um, because um, my votes, you don't um, count? Yeah, so I don't count. So it's, it's eight out of 14, so. Okay. <laughs> and and I want to go to bed. <laughs> And I want to go to bed, Scott says. Yes, okay. He's been um, all day. I woke up at four o'clock in Cartagena, so. <laughs> there we go. So we have one abstain. Four o'clock. Yeah. We've got, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, we, the chance, any any no votes. And if, if you want to vote no, I, I, I will totally respect that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, have you guys voted yet? Yeah, no. You can abstain or vote no. Oh, you said I? Yeah. Oh, then we're there. Scott did, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
I mean, I will vote I because I, I want to, I support and I just want to make a commitment to one another to do this work, you know, authentically yes. with curiosity and with as much objectivity as we can. And that is that. Yes. yes. No, yes. I, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, uh, motion, I think we're at a motion to adjourn. We do have uh, we do, policy monitor reports. Oh, do we? We can table them until next week. Are we also well, let me ask a question. Does, did anyone have any objections to the policy monitoring reports? No. 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 <laughs> Do I have a motion to approve the policy monitoring reports, which I'm sure are listed on the sheet? So I'm moved. Second. Yep, got it. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Um, it looks like we will schedule a meeting for next week. Does the 13th make the most sense? Probably. We have negotiations. But I don't know if it'll collapse. And it's 4.15 to 6.15. Okay. Um, why don't we just do it on, on that Wednesday? Or do we want to do it maybe on the Tuesday or Thursday? Because we've gotten people have not been happy with us overlapping with the city council. Can people do it Tuesday? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday. I don't know. Twelve. Meet the coaches here at on Tuesday. Tuesday school for Friday. Oh, that's Tuesday. Five thirty to six thirty. Yeah. No, at six thirty is the high school, right? Right. Starts at six thirty. I've got so many rooms in this building, Nathan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are you talking? About Isn't there? There's a a track. There's a meet the coaches. Uh, yeah. At five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I've got a huge auditorium for those 85 tracksters that can go right in there or a gym. Well, let, let's do it Wednesday. The The city council passed their budget and hopefully they've they've got happier things to talk about. Um, Wednesday the 13th? Yeah, yeah the 13th. Let's just, let's just keep it on a Wednesday. Um, you are? Let's do it Tuesday. Let's do it Tuesday. We can't. on an airplane on Wednesday at 6.30, so... If it's Tuesday. To Tuesday. 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 Tuesday's okay. fine. Yeah. We, yeah. Air, airplanes and share um, <laughs> yeah. are, are Hey, important. this is late notice. People yeah. were probably planning around having regular board Lives. meetings scheduled, yeah. not special yes. board meetings yeah. scheduled. Um, yeah. 6.30. Okay. Nathan, you're in the gym. <laughs> uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank, thank you, everyone. I know this is very hard, and um, we're we're doing a really good job. Thank you. You too.